Good afternoon, everyone. We are going to go ahead and call the uh, August meeting of the Cobb County Board of Elections um, Committee to order at 3.04 p.m. I thank you all for your presence uh, this evening. And I just want to go ahead and set some ground rules because I think it's necessary. Uh, first and foremost, you likely saw on the agenda that we revised the time period that's allotted to individuals to speak uh, from five minutes to two minutes. Uh, based upon, um, I'll be honest, we are required to be out of here by 6 p.m. Um, so we've got three hours, now two hours and 56 minutes to conclude this meeting. We've got a number of things that need to take place. Um, early um, advanced in-person voting, polling location changes, and of course the challenges. Per our, um, per our notes on the website, we generally limit uh, the number of individuals that have the opportunity to participate in public comment to 12 of those individuals in person and 12 of those individuals virtually. Obviously, the signups have exceeded that number, and we are going to try to accommodate everyone. But again, that's why at the outset of this meeting, I am stating that we must be out of here by 6 p.m. And so, invariably, there will be some of you that will not have the opportunity to speak, and I will apologize for that in advance. But to conduct the business of this board, we must place some time limits and, and some parameters on the opportunity for public comment. And I'm hopeful that you all will understand where we're coming from and why that must take place. With that, we'll go ahead and open up public, public comment. We will, oh, also, I note that there are some of you that signed up for in-person public comment and that you are presently here, you have been noted. We will not, um, obviously we'll take you in person and we're gonna start with the virtual public comment. Have we confirmed whether individuals are on the line? I know in some instances we have because they're in person or those persons, have we confirmed whether anyone's on the line? Do we have folks on the line? If you could give me just a number. I can't tell the number. You can't tell the number? No problem, because the, the number of individuals we don't take at the, at, at the instance um, virtually, we were going to bump that number over. Okay. Um, and just for the sake of time management, we're going to start off with limiting pub public comment to 45 minutes. And I apologize for that. Um, we can come back at a later time as we take up individual items on the agenda. But again, it's necessary that while we absolutely want to hear from each of you, it's absolutely necessary that we are able to conduct the, the um, business of the, of the board. With that, the first individual that signed up for public comment, uh, Howard Brooking, online. Are you with us, Mr. Brooking? Mr. Brooking is not online with us, Chairwoman. Okay, we'll go on to a Delane Clemens. Mr. and Mrs. Delane Clemens. They are not on. Why don't I start? Um, Mr. Allen, Bill Allen is on right now. Okay, William Allen, I see it. Go right ahead. And Mr. Allen, thank you for joining us. Um, again, you have two minutes, sir. I got it. Right. You're welcome to speak, Mr. Allen. Thank you for being there. I am linked in on a Cisco WebEx event to the meeting that's going on right now. But for some reason, I have no sound. I can't hear them. And uh, I'm trying to reach out for some help on what I'm doing wrong. He can't, Mr. Okay. Allen, you cannot they hear can, me? They can hear. Hmm. Okay. We will have to come back to Mr. Allen. I have um, Lindsay Favreau on the line. Lindsay, you are free to speak. Yes. Awesome. Um, I'm Lindsay. I'm a Cobb County voter, and I'd like to emphasize the importance of doing everything we can to increase voter accessibility, specifically by increasing early voting locations and having them open from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. seven days a week. I'd also like to advocate for having the maximum number of ballot boxes possible and ensuring that 
poll workers have adequate support and so that there's adequate staff. Um, when it comes to increasing early voting locations, they need to be equitably distributed across the county. So that includes rural, rural locations, urban and suburban areas, and South Cobb. And I'd like to suggest 20 early voting locations. Um, and then uh, the importance of timing, having as much time as possible, um, so that's 7 a.m., 7 p.m., and Sundays, because people are different and what one person might need uh, might differ from what another person might need. So having as many chances to vote as possible is important. Um, I'd also want to emphasize the importance of ballot boxes and that everywhere that is capable of having an absentee ballot box should have one. In the past, I've heard some of you speculating about the cost of having these open, and I'd like to caution against that. We can't put a cost on votes, and the perception of cost is relative and easily influenced by bias. And contrary to the lies that are being spread, ballot boxes are secure and safe. And if there's any doubt to their security, then that should be invested in instead of just removing ballot boxes in general. Um, I know I have family members who are high risk medically, and this is their preferred option. And ballot boxes are a low barrier solution to voting that should be utilized. Um, as far as poll worker support, um, I would like to advocate for adequate staffing and um, maybe looking into the use of social media or KSU to recruit poll workers and having um, shifts for entry level positions so that more people with Ms. Favera, I apologize. I must interrupt you again due to the number of individuals that are here. We've limited individuals to speaking to two minutes. I understand. Um, thank you for your time. My apologies. So we're, again, more ground rules. And this is probably the most important one, and I neglected to mention it. If there are outbursts, you will be requested to leave. We will be respectful. We will be civil towards each other. Again, thank you, Ms. Favera. Chairwoman, we have Phyllis Gordon on the line. Okay, Ms. Ms. Gordon can go ahead and speak. Yes, uh, my name is Phyllis Gordon. I'm a resident of Austell. I received an email um, the other day regarding poll workers. They had a shortage of, of poll workers in Cobb County. And um, the thing is, is that I tried, I attempted two times to apply. One was in May, um, electronically. And then the second time when I went to vote in June, I picked up a, 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 a document and completed it and sent it and mailed it in on the address that was on the application. However, I never heard anything from anyone. So I'm just asking if um, that obviously there's an issue with that. So I'm just asking if uh, you all can just try to find out, you know, in that office what's going on. Okay. And that's just the only thing that I have. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Gordon. Um, there is an email address on the website. If you'll email that address, my email address is on the website as well. If you will email me, we'll make certain that your application and your name is passed along. And thank you for your willingness to serve as a poll worker. Who else is on the line? Are you able to see the number of individuals that are on the line with us? Yes, ma'am. We ha we have a total of five. There's um, Miss Northrup is next, and then um, Mr. Allen. Um, I'm trying to get him situated so he can um, converse with you guys too. Excellent. We appreciate that, Miss Northrup. You can speak. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Shelley Northrup, and I live and work in Smyrna. With the upcoming general election, it's imperative that the Board of Elections does all that it can to ensure all eligible voters have access to voting. I recommend having at least 17 early voting locations and the maximum number of drop boxes possible that are spread out throughout the county. All early voting locations must be open from six from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. So all voters, despite work schedule, child care, transportation, and other factors are able to access voting. And there must be Sunday voting for both Sundays to accommodate voters. A few years ago during early voting, I waited in line for about an hour and a half to vote. And that was during early voting in the early afternoon. Voters after me, which was about after 5 p.m., had to wait even longer. And the line started to spill out into the street. 
Many voters are unable to wait in line for such a long time for various reasons, so we must ensure the full time for early voting, including both Sundays. I also request that the Whitlock location remains an early voting location as voters are used to that location and there is a high voter turnout in the past at that location. Removing it will create unnecessary confusion for voters, especially as we are less than 100 days until the election. Again, I ask that the board must provide at least 17 early voting locations that are from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., including both Sundays and the maximum number of drop boxes and also including the Whitlock location for early voting. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Northrup. Are we able to get Mr. Allen on? Hello, I'm here. Mr. Allen, you can hear me, correct? I can hear you, yes. You... I'm on, hearing you over the telephone. I couldn't on my computer. Go ahead. Okay, you are good to go, sir. And just recognize that you only have two minutes on. I apologize for that, but go ahead and get started. Okay, well, I haven't timed my response, but thank you for allowing me to talk. Uh, my comment is simply, obviously, we want everyone to be able to vote, and we should have uh, voting available to everyone. However, my feelings are that with advanced voting open at least a month, I think it opens October 17th, there's ample time for people to vote. I mean, there was a time when we voted on Election Day, and we've improved that. But any virtue taken to, a vi taken to the extreme becomes a vice. And human nature knows no particular political party. The real world is both parties have participated in voting abuses. And to keep the door open for potential abuse should be done only as little as required to ensure everyone can vote. My comment is that Sunday voting is certainly not necessary. Sunday is, a, for many people, is a sacred day. It's a day of rest. It's a day of worship. It's a day to be with families. To open on Sundays would cost taxpayers money. It would have buildings open when you have to pay double time. There's just no reason to try and open on Sundays. It, we're already understaffed, and weekend duty for law enforcement officers and government employees is something no one wants to do. So we should have open available to everyone, voting available to everyone, but uh, it seems to me we've done that. We've come a long ways in doing that. I have voted since 1976 in Cobb County and very seldom had to wait very long. Uh, the, the most I can remember waiting was maybe about 15 or 20 minutes. So we should have enough voting locations where everyone can vote, but to do it on Sunday is is unnecessary and, and, and shouldn't happen. It's a affront to many people who view that as a worship day. I don't, I'm a poll worker. I don't want to have to work on Sunday. Thank you very much for your time and, and hope you're listening. Yes, we were listening, sir, and thank you for um, dialing in and being patient with the technical difficulties. Um, I believe you said that there were five individuals on the phone. I believe we've heard from four. Yep, I have Miss Campbell. I'm unmuting you now, Lisa. You are free to speak. Go ahead, Miss Campbell. Afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for this opportunity to speak, Cobb Board of Elections and staff. My name is Lisa Campbell. I grew up here in Cobb County, and I moved back to Kennesaw, where I now reside almost five years ago. Today, I'm speaking as a concerned citizen, a Cobb County homeowner, taxpayer, business owner, voter, and pro-voting rights candidate for Georgia's House District 35. Today, I'd like to ask for your individual commitment and collective pledge to protect access to the ballot box for all eligible Cobb County voters. I'd like to suggest changes to protect and restore voters' access, including creating an online form for absentee ballot request, communicating all ballot issues with voters through every available method, implementing ranked choice voting for our elderly and disabled, offering a secure drop box in all precincts, including the main office during early voting and through and on election day, protecting 17 early voting locations and restoring the maximum number of drop boxes, allowing early voting locations to be open from 7A to 7P and um, both Sundays of early voting and require people submitting voter challenges to include consistent verification information. Today, I'd also like to speak to the need to ensure that partisan actors do not usurp the will of Cobb County voters. Respectfully, I submit that Patrick Garland was involved in the wrongdoing of the Georgia fake electors and may be complicit in activity relating to the Georgia fake electors. I ask the board to consider how he may be trusted with election decisions going forward, and I ask for his written explanation as was previously requested 
in the board meeting on July 11th with notice duly served in person by Dr. Ahmad Soli. Finally, I'd like to highlight that this past weekend was the anniversary of the 1965 Voting Rights Act that President Johnson signed into law saying, the command of the Constitution is plain. It is wrong, deadly wrong, to deny any of your fellow Americans the right to vote in this country. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Campbell. We'll now continue with public comment in the room. And again, I, I would respectfully request that the outburst cease. The laughing out loud is extremely disrespectful, and I believe it's well within our right to ask individuals to, to leave. Am I correct, Daniel? Correct. This is at a public meeting, you know, there are dedicated times for people to comment. And if you've signed up to comment, you can comment. But we don't need uh, audible disruptive reactions from the audience. And if, if we need to ask people to leave, we're allowed to do that if they're disrupting the meeting. Excellent. Thank you so much. We will start with at least 19 individuals in the room and as much that we allow 12 in person, 12 virtual. There were five speakers. Uh, that took place online. So that's where we are. Um, 12 plus 7 is 19. We'll start with 19 and we'll see where, how far we get. Uh, to start, a Mr. Thomas Tucker. Hey there, y'all. Thank you for your time and thank you for your commitment and service to Cobb County. You know, I think it's, it's everyone's heart here that we have fair, and easy to access elections. However, I feel like Georgia already meets that criteria. We're one of the top 15 states in early voting days, and we are one of the few states that allows absentee ballots sent to your home upon request with no required reason given. It's already been stated in, in previous meetings that poll workers and poll watchers are understaffed by 40%. This would simply add to that, add, add to that further need and is something that we, that we already cannot meet with, a, with the given Early, early voting lo lo locations and days we have, and these increased days would simply further, would further increase this, this issue. And as stated earlier, both parties have committed fraud in previous elections to, to, to varying degrees, and a, a lack of poll watchers and workers is the number one reason for that reason, for, for fraud in elections. So therefore, since we are already understaffed, I believe this would simply increase the chance of fraud by either party in, in, in upcoming elections. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Tucker. John Mol Moline. McLean, apologies, I couldn't read that. I've been called worse. <laughs> <laughs> Call me guy, somebody said one time. Anyway, John McLean, I'm speaking as a resident and taxpayer of Cobb County. I live out in, near Powder Springs. Um, so some people may disagree, that there's, but there's a lot of, there's some suspicion about the safe and sec safety and security of our elections. So I decided to get personally involved and become a poll worker not a poll watcher, but a poll worker. And I did that in the primary election, and just wanted to tell you that we were two people short at our, at our polling location. Uh, nobody got a chance to eat lunch. We had to eat lunch while we were working. Nobody got a break. Um, at one time, I had to keep people from entering the exit, at the same time greeting the people that were coming in the correct entrance and then helping people get their ballots scanned into the scanner all at the same time. And that was an issue. And I just don't understand with the county saying that they're 40% understaffed and then add, wanting to add 147 new positions at the same time, I don't understand how you can justify adding more days. If you're gonna have safe and secure elections, and that should be your responsibility, You've got to man all these places, and you can't right now. So I ask you to not consider adding more days. People got plenty of opportunities to vote. Um, I haven't had to wait more than 15 minutes. And when I worked for the primary election, I don't remember anybody waiting more than about 15 minutes the whole day long. So that's my personal opinion. I'm speaking as a, that's my personal experience. So. I hope you'll listen and take that under consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McLean. 
Sam Henderson. Hi, my name is Sam Henderson. I'm a longtime resident of Marietta and uh, Whitlock Heights. I want to say thank you to the board and thank you to uh, all my fellow citizens who are interested in what I assume we all would want to be is accessible uh, and broadly participative elections. I'm here to thank the board for all the ways that you have provided for citizens like me to vote when we knew in many cases we would not be able to vote if it was only during elections. Um, call me uh, irresponsible or scattered or whatever, I've probably used every available early voting option at some time or another. I've skidded in at the last hour for drop boxes. I've been uh, flying in from the Northeast and work some time to use the last day of early voting. I've done it all. Thank you. And I will say that um, I hope that our concern is less about fearful avoidance of circumstances and fraud that virtually never happen and have been demonstrated to virtually never happen. And we focus a lot more on how do we help all the perfectly legal, clearly registered voters vote when many times they have crazy schedules and everything like that. I've got a 94-year-old father, almost didn't get to vote in the last election, though he had four children with graduate degrees in the Atlanta area all trying to help him vote. They had cut back hours, they had changed locations, they had removed and curtailed drop boxes, and uh, we went to DEF CON 4 just with four kids trying to get my dad's vote into Thank the right place. Thank you, sir. I apologize for interrupting. I just, again, want to remind individuals two minutes, given the number of people speaking. Absolutely. Thank Generally, you. Generally, I would not interrupt you, but I apologize. We do have to move on. Great. Thank you. Please, as much voting opportunities as you can. Thank you, Mr. Henderson. Sally Grubbs. Sure. And I won't start your time until you start talking. Good afternoon and thank you, board. My name is Sally Grubbs. I'm the chairwoman of the Cobb County Republican Party. Um, <clears throat> when we talk about the cost of votes, I would like to remind everyone who's listening that the cost of the vote and going to the ballot box is borne on the shoulders of the men and women who have served this country in battle. It comes at a very high price. And uh, sometimes when we're talking about access to the ballot box, no one wants that more than me. However, there is reason and there is um, what would be considered uh, just what, what is, it's just a reasonable thing. Um, we're a community, regardless of political party, we must work <coughs> together. However, what has become clear is that Cobb County is a target of fair fight and the extreme radical left. From the commission to the Board of Elections, fair fight is out for Cobb. And you can see that when it comes to voter challenges and cleaning the voter rolls. Why would you, Cobb residents and part of our community, allow any entity taking millions of dollars from across the country to effectuate change in Cobb, as is evidenced by what I handed out? That is a paid for advertisement on Facebook by Fair Fight and shamefully has all of your email addresses for people to sign up and register through Fair Fight to email you. So I want to know how many people in the audience and online are here at the behest of Fair Fight. From pushing for contracted poll workers at the expense of taxpayers to now dictating the number of days of early voting and early voting locations. Are you, as representatives of the Board of Elections, going to be an extension of Fair Fight, a political action committee, by allowing Sunday voting? If you vote for Sunday voting in expanded locations, you are showing your allegiance to Fair Fight and not the citizens of Cobb. The numbers do not support the additional days. Show me in the numbers where this is warranted. We I know the apologize. reason. 
you're at your two minutes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Debbie Fisher. Good afternoon. Debbie Fisher from East Cobb, representing myself as a taxpaying citizen. <coughs> There's been a lot of uh, back and forth on Sunday voting. Um, apparently it is not being proposed, um, nor is 17 voting locations, um, nor extended hours. So in answer to Chairman Grubbs's question, how many people are here supporting Fairfight, it sounds like there's quite a few. One would think that uh, someone, an organization, owned um, by a person running for governor would know Georgia election laws. We can't have drop boxes in every location. We're already at a max. So to put that out there, and have people think that these things are allowable only furthers their statements of voter suppression, which is nothing more than falsehoods. So I hope that when you're determining what we end up with, whether it's 10, 12, 13, or 17, the locations, the call to action from Fair Fight and Stacey Abrams is not a legitimate request. And I also want to add, your meeting minutes did not include the comments from your legal counsel on your um, policy to put forward your five points versus what the law allows. I think that needs to be read into your meeting minutes because it is important, because it does not follow Georgia law. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fisher. Holly Gu. Hi, my name is Holly Gu. I'm a Cobb uh, resident. Here I want to express, express about my concern of the adding more voting days and the draw boxes. I was a poll watcher both at the main office on Whitlock and the Paces Foundation near Cumberland during uh, primary 2022. Last week, I received a 195 check before tax for being a poll worker. This paid for my about 20 hours working for just one day uh, working as a poll worker. So apparently, this is not a paid job, but a technically a volunteer job. When I ran into the election supervisor at the Paces Foundation, she was desperate to find the poll workers because there were not enough people who want to volunteer. And many poll workers, they never returned after first try. I would like to ask the lady spoke earlier on the phone, how many such gruesome long poll days that they have worked and they're willing to work? Um, during the observation, as a poll watcher, as a poll worker, I noticed there are never been a line. Most of the time, there were more poll workers than voters. On the contrary, all the poll workers would rather the county reduce the number of advanced voting days and adding more pace to the poll workers so that more people are willing to volunteer. I understand that voting should be accessible without limitation intimidation, but it should also be designed to limit fraud. Adding more drop boxes only creates the opportunity for fraud. I grew up in China, a country that was controlled by Chinese Communist Party. Government officials are not elected, but appointed. As a result, you end up with an incompetent government Ms. with corruption and cronyism. Fraudulent elections has no difference you. between Ms. CCP's no mic, elections. Please, please okay. come on. I mean, we, we set the rules. The rules are Got what it. they Thank are. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Reardon. So um, I'm Pamela Reardon. I live in East Cobb and um, been here since 99. Holly is really, really, really 
she, um, she's, she's lived in communist China. So that's why she is desperate to have her voice heard, just so you know. Um, also, some comments that have been made have been um, absolutely wrong. And there was definitely voter fraud in 2020. I've seen it. So we are wanting every single early or every single legal voter to vote and for that vote to count, OK? They can go to the end of their driveway and put their absentee ballot in a drop box. It's called a mailbox. And Biden has already put $10 billion more dollars into the postal system. They have set up a separate department to get the mail to and from free now, OK? Add that to our freebies. So there's no, there's no reason. We are allowed six um, drop boxes. They have to be manned. They have to be watched. They have to be open during early voting. I also protest to having the talk about having the Saturday, the Sunday, the Monday before the actual voting day to have people come in and put them in the library. That is totally illegal, OK, and illegal. We'll fight that. In fact, next session, I will fight to get the drop boxes absolutely taken out because I'm done with this. Eight locations in the primary were adequate. Adequate. In fact, two locations had very, very, very low attendance. So trying to increase it even more to 10 or 12, or even an ungodly number like 17, is unheard of. We are in a recession. These cost money. Holy day is Sunday. The workers need and uh, they need to rest. And, and last go around in the primary, they told me that they were having thank, a hard time seven thank till seven. Thank you, Ms. Reardon. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for the work you do. Uh, yes, go right ahead. Do you realize you are Ms. Falk? No, I'm Jenny Carroll. OK. Oh, I skipped you. Jenny Carroll. Um, Ms. Falk, I know that you are next, but one of the individuals that was Per, that you, you will have the opportunity to speak. I just wanted to preempt okay. someone else coming up right after you're finished because a Mr. Randall Rogers is on the line. Correct, Jenny? Okay. But go right ahead. Hi, my name is Jenny Carroll, um, and I'm here to urge you not to expand the vo voting opportunities uh, beyond what we've been provided in the past. Uh, the expansions are not a good idea for several reasons. The first is cost. Adding more drop boxes, more voting hours, more polling locations, Sunday hours will cost the county more in terms of poll workers and police security. We are in a recession and the county should scale back its spending, not ramp it up. The second is the staffing shortage. Uh, we lack qualified poll workers who are able to and willing to work additional hours and monitor additional elections equipment. I worked as a poll watcher and a poll worker so I can speak to this firsthand. Your elections managers are already having a tough time finding people who will work the long hours required and who understand how to set up the complex elections equipment. Your staff is overworked already. Expecting more won't help the situation. The workers need Sunday off as a day of rest. If we're unable to fill these uh, positions with our current labor pool, we're going to have to go to a third party contractor like Happy Faces. And you guys know from Fulton County's experience, that's not a good experience. Their quality of service is subpar. Um, the third reason is that providing more early voting opportunities creates more opportunities for errors, fraud, and irregularities in the voting process. I can speak to this as a former fraud auditor. Complex open systems create weak internal controls that can lead to mistakes and malfeasance by dishonest individuals. Please keep voting simple. Finally, I would like to remind you that this is a nonpartisan issue. Uh, the residents of Cobb County don't want you unnecessarily wasting our tax dollars. We don't want you to use outside agencies to run and mishandle our elections process. We don't want weaker internal controls that comprom compromise election integrity. Please vote no to expanding the number of drop boxes. Thank you, Ms. Carroll. Et cetera. Thank you, Ms. Carroll. Thank you, and thank you for what you do. Do we have Mr. Randall Rogers? Online. Oops, 
who's ma who's assisting us? Kendra, are you able to unmute Mr. Rogers? Okay, no worries. We will continue moving on here in the office. Um, Ms. Falk, Claudia Falk. Hi, I'm here to speak for the people who are in the trenches. All of us people who do your job for you every election, every day that advanced voting. I'm Claudia Falk. I'm an area supervisor with Cobb Elections. <clears throat> I've been working for Cobb Elections as an area supervisor for 21 years. I was the first original person to start advanced voting. I was asked by the administration to do that. And for 14 years, for the most part, I've hired all of the people by myself. As early as late as uh, 2020, I personally called 259 workers uh, multiple times, and of the, that 154 uh, was I able to hire. Of course, rescheduling. Scheduling poll workers for advanced voting was a nightmare. And now, with the seven to seven, and the turn, having it in uh, shifts, it's an even bigger nightmare because you're constantly focusing on who's coming and who is, who's going. We're all tired. We're all stressed. There's been a lot of turnover among poll workers for election day and dropping out, poll workers for advanced voting and dropping out. Administration of Cobb County elections, there's been a lot of turnover there and people working in the office. It has been a stressful time for all of us and we need to step back just a little bit Give us time to rebuild our uh, employee base, our poll worker base, and build good, strong teams to ensure the integrity and the honesty of our elections and the openness. What we're doing is after every election, there is always people, before you can even pull your newspaper out, who are complaining about all the bad experiences they had speaking of voters. And by the way, the poll workers, Falk. we're voters and we're Ms. citizens of Cobb County too. Thank you, Ms. Thank Falk. you. Walt Lyles. Thank you, give me just a minute to speak. Uh, my name is Walt Lyles, I'm a Cobb County uh, resident, I'm a taxpayer. I'm also a, a co-owner of business, and uh, we work hard for our money in Cobb County. We're really tired of seeing it wasted. So this whole idea of going to Sunday, no. Just flat out no. Doesn't need to happen. Commissioner, The commissioner the other day at a meeting, at a town hall meeting, she was explaining that she has 1,400 workers down in this county. Okay? She is struggling to get people hired, trying to get people on staff. The bottom line is this organization right here, there's no way that they can pull off a Sunday and try to hire people and do stuff. The whole, the whole county, including the whole state, <coughs> companies cannot put people to work right now. There's just not a workforce out there. So trying to do any kind of growth of this sort is just not a good economical time to do this, okay? There is real money associated with this, and it's our money, okay? This is not somebody else's money, it's taxpayer money, okay? So the bottom line is there's plenty of times, opportunities to vote. I have worked, I've traveled all my life, I've always gotten in in time to vote, even up to the very last minute if I had to. I showed up at the poll to vote. If somebody wants to vote, they will get there to vote, and they should be there to vote. This is a, just a bunch of bull. I keep trying to come in and extend all this other stuff. It's, it's just it's not right, okay? That's where I stand. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lyles. Enid Alexander. Good afternoon. I want to thank all of you for your time today. My name is Enid Alexander. I've lived in Atlanta longer than I've lived anywhere else. And I grew up in Texas, but I've lived here 48 years. So, and I'm very proud to be a citizen of Cobb County. Um, I too have worked in the past as a poll worker 
and a poll watcher, and I can absolutely vouch for the long hours, the hard labor of putting together these machines <clears throat> uh, is not small. It is not a small task, and we were stretched out and so tired that I did not come back this season for that very reason. Nevertheless, I also want to talk to my first reaction when I saw the proposal for 17 minimum um, early voting Sunday locations, and I said to myself, uh, how do we pay for this? It's my question as to, I'm hearing from very many people saying that we are in a um, down economy, in, with which I agree, that observation. I'm feeling it myself. I see it in my gas tank, I see it in my food. So I know we are strapped for our monies. We want to make good use of them. I do not feel that we have the money to assure me that there will be adequate controls and safeguards to make sure at each and every one of these locations that there is integrity in the boxes, not just access to the boxes, but integrity when they are accessed. And less than until I can see that that can be assured, I definitely am not in favor of Sunday voting. And as Pam has, uh, Ms. Reardon has said earlier, there is that mailbox at the end of your house. You can use that for your, your drop box. And I thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Alexander. I'll note the time is 3.45. We've not yet met this, the number of individuals that we indicated that we would um, allow to speak. So we're going to extend it for another 15 minutes in hopes of trying to get at least through 24 speakers. Um, so with that, well, Mr. Parks, Boyd Parks. While Mr. Parks makes his way up, do you realize once we start the balance of the agenda, if there is an opportunity to allow for others to speak, you will be allowed to speak. I prefer to allow everyone that signed up, to, or we as a board, prefer to allow everyone to speak, but do, again, recognize the time limitations we're under. Mr. Parks, go right ahead. Thank you. I went to the trouble of printing out my uh, agenda ahead of time, as I normally do, and it says five minutes. So I, um, I, I had... do understand that, sir, and I will stop your time while I'm speaking. Um, we revised that when we saw the number of individuals that had signed up online. I then contacted Ms. Evler last Friday, and we reposted the agenda. So I do understand that you printed the. It was reposted, correct, with the two-minute time frame. Okay. So I, I apologize, but you will have a minute and 50 seconds to speak. Good afternoon. I'm Boyd Parks from Ackworth. First, um, for con thank you for uh, continuing the challenge hearings. I want to commend you, Mr. Bruning, uh, for your question about folks who've moved. It's very important to know that if they have moved <clears throat> to their new state since they moved and registered, however, it is much more important to know if they voted in Georgia since they moved. So I think we need to look at that if we're not doing so. For election integrity, people who have moved need to be removed from the rolls <clears throat> to prevent the use of their registration by criminals voting using the moved person's former registration. Second, the drop boxes must go. The documentary 2000 Mules clearly shows evidence of a coordinated, funded, illegal ballot trafficking network across at least critical swing states, including Georgia. No private funds should go to finance elections. No funds should go to finance drop boxes. Third, regarding advanced voting, I've voted here for, since 1970 after serving the Air Force during Vietnam. Sure, during that 52 years, we have had more, we have more people now, but we were able to vote in a single day then. <clears throat> We currently have more than enough early voting places and we have more than enough early voting days. We certainly don't need to stretch that out to work on Sundays. 
There's absolutely no need to open the polls or vote on Sunday. Fourth and finally, the elephants in the polling places are the machines. The machines must go. Per Federal Judge Totenberg, the systems that were used November 3rd, 2020 and since are Thank illegal you, and unfit Parks. for use. And thank I do you. note that you emailed that to us, so I do know what the balance of what your statements were, and thank you for emailing that to us in advance. Thank you for that and all. Thank you for your service. Thank you, sir. Sabrina, last name starts with either a G or a C. I'm sorry, your, man, your name, ma'am? Yes, got it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I'm a, a registered Georgia voter, voter um, but I've also voted in three other states, and only in the state of Georgia have I ever had a wait um, in line for, I think two hours was the longest time, and it happened, I don't recall what ele which election it was, but it was very cold, and I had to wait, which is fine. It's my civic duty, I'm happy to to do it. I'll wait as long as necessary. However, in the last election, I was able to vote uh, via a drop box. I don't know how I ended up with the circumstances that led me to the drop box, but I found it to be um, very, very helpful, and I wish that we would keep them and do what we can to um, keep it safe, which seems to be a concern of everyone's and mine as well. But um, to have more voting places, if we can make that available for certain people who don't have as much access as others. Um, I think that early voting, uh, not early voting, excuse me, Sunday voting is also um, a good idea as well. We do many other things on Sunday. People talk about Sunday being a holy day, but we sell alcohol, people go to the movies. There are lots of other things that are available to do on Sunday. Voting seems to be a very productive thing. So um, I'm in favor of Cobb County doing what it can to extend uh, early voting more drop boxes um, that's also safe and effective and budget friendly for the county. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gallen. Bob Maynard. Hello. Um, I'm a Cobb County resident, married a resident. I've been a poll watcher for a number of years. My wife's been a poll watcher and a poll worker. She just had surgery, so she's not here. But during the last couple of elections, I actually had to bring food up to her because the poll workers are so overworked. Uh, I'd really like to give a shout out to the poll workers because they do a tremendous job. Um, to add an additional burden to them to work on Sundays is just unconscionable. I think you're gonna come out with all sorts of things slipping through the cracks and we don't want that. There's more than an adequate time for people to vote if they plan their schedule correctly. And as been noted before, there is a drop box at the end of everyone's driveway. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Maynard. Mr. Ahmad Salai. Hello, my name is Ahmad Sali. Um, I practiced emergency medicine for 28 years in California before I moved to Cobb County. And uh, it's amazing how much we did in very trying circumstances by having the priorities A, B, C, airway, breathing, circulation. And it didn't matter what the medical or surgical problem was, with the help of God, we did our best and saved a lot of lives. Now, in the case of this election board, I think also having a very simple uh, priority system will have us do the best that we can do. I realize we have limited number of workers, we have limited money, we have limited this or that, but I definitely want to applaud Ms. Silas and the board for uh, upholding the underlying principle, which I believe everyone has said, is getting as many legal voters the opportunity to vote. So I support more drop boxes, more days voting, take the money from somewhere else. But 
I applaud you for what you've done so far. Also, I just wanted to say people who were uh, challenging voters uh, as if being registered in more than one state is something wrong. Uh, th the last thing I saw by doing a Google search, there were 2.75 million people in this country who were registered in more than one state. Being registered in more than one state is not illegal. Only voting in more than one state is illegal. Thank you, Mr. Sala. Christina Rosman. Hello, Christine Rosman speaking on behalf of myself. <clears throat> um, like many others, I was a poll watcher and the probably six times I poll watched um, on advanced voting at Tim Lee and also at um, Whitlock. Whitlock was busier, but I can say with, at Tim Lee, I'd say 95% of the time there were more staff, managers, um, I think the Dominion tech guy was in, uh, poll, compared to how many people were actually in line. So I think that it's kind of overkill. It's kind of like going to Publix at 8 o'clock on Sunday morning, like it's dead. And it was pretty much dead when I was there. So I think it's kind of overkill. And um, I believe I wrote an um, <coughs> email. I did write an email to all of you. And um, kind of comparing, like, France. France has 32 million voters. And they wrap that up in one day. They do an election in one day, and they have it wrapped up and know who the winner is by 8 o'clock at night. And I think I would imagine that you're, that's kind of embarrassing to like look at the volume that they do and the volume that we're trying to do over really, like, uh, what, three weeks, four weeks, whatever, and just leaves a lot of room to uh, do some kind of fraudulent things. So anyway, um, but... I will say, um, my, my uh, doctor, he asked me, like, what do you think about all the voting? Are you happy about it? And I said, I, I'd love to see it for one day. And he goes, oh, well, that would be inconvenient for me and my wife because we're physicians, and, and we wouldn't be able to do that. We need extra time. And I said, you know what's really, Thank you, really Ms. inconvenient? Thank you, Rosman. Thank you. Communism. Thank you. Thank you. Patricia Hay. I'm going to try to time myself so that I don't go over, but I doubt I will because I don't like to public speak. Miss, uh, hey. I work in. Uh, I work in. I work. I worked as a poll worker for advance voting, and during the election, and I was. I wanted to say that. Um, there was plenty of chances for people to vote in the three weeks that they had in the two Saturdays. And uh, they all waited to the last minute on Friday, and that's when they had to wait. And I told them, if you go on election day, you won't have any waiting. So there's three weeks, people, and two weekends, and we don't need Sunday voting. I'm, I'm telling you, these people that work the advance voting that work every day, 12-hour shifts, for five days times three weeks, and then Saturdays from 9 to 5, that's enough. They're worn out. I'm here to tell you they are, because I saw it. So I, I just wanted to say that as an election worker, and I hope I'm an election worker again, and I appreciate the chance. And that's really all I've got to say, but uh, people have plenty of chance to vote if they want to vote. They really do, and I'm not, I'm not trying to make any points or anything, but they have plenty of chances to vote. Trust me, I saw it, and, and human nature, they all waited till the Friday before, and then they had to wait in long lines, and I felt bad, but if they hadn't done that, they could have had no waiting in advance voting for the, all the three weeks before. I just wanted to say that. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hay. 
the final speaker before we move to the balance of the agenda and then noting that we'll try our best to get back th um, to the balance of you where it looks like there are eight individuals left. Um, but the final speaker for public comment is Lisa Thomas. Hello, and thank you for uh, everything that you do. Thank you, Ms. Um, I just want to tell you about my personal situation. I've lived in Cobb County since 1991. I live with my husband, my daughter, and my mother-in-law. My husband works full-time for an international co uh, corporation and travels extensively. He also does research at one of our local universities. My daughter recently graduated. Prior to that, she worked part-time and went to school full-time. She's now is graduated and has a real job. And um, I worked as an engineer and a school teacher until 2018 when my mother-in-law, who is fully disabled, moved in with us. I'm now her caregiver. Uh, between everybody's schedules, work, school, uh, other service things that we do, and my mother-in-law's health, uh, it's difficult for all of us to get to to vote at any one given time. A lot of times we have things that come up at the last minute. I personally can only vote when some, one of the other two family members can be home with my mother-in-law. For me personally, Sunday voting is critical. It is one of the few times that my husband is in the country and there are not meetings scheduled. I know that you People have mentioned that it's a day of rest. It's not a day of rest or a holy day for every single person in Cobb County. There are many faiths represented, and I just would like you to keep all of those things in mind. I'm sure I'm not the only person, the only family that has these issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Thomas. So um, again, thank everyone for your patience and your understanding in us altering kind of the timing, if you will, with regard to the public comment. We'll go ahead and continue with the balance of the agenda. Uh, the next item on the agenda is approval of the minutes. Um, in speaking with my colleagues, my understanding, um, Ms. Mossbacher, there are a couple of items that have been brought to your attention. Should, if it's okay with everybody, move to actually approve them in the next meeting so we can go ahead and make the suggestions that I've heard from out there and from the fellow board members. Okay. Is there a motion? Yeah, I motion to. I motion to approve them at the next meeting. Sorry. To, to table. To table them. Sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is there a second? Second. Okay, it's been moved and properly seconded to table the approval of the July 11th meeting minutes until our September meeting. If you'll vote, please, whether you are in favor or not. The motion passes. Thank you. Moving on to the next item on the agenda is the um, public hearing portion. Uh, we will be taking up, um, in the first instance, three proposed polling uh, place location changes. Ms. Evler, will you or one um, of your staff members? In the interest of time, I decided I would do them. Normally, I would bring up a member of my staff, but we're just going to try and go as quickly as possible. We thank you. Okay, so the first item is for uh, Precinct Clarkdale 01. <clears throat> we would like to move the polling location from Luke Garrett Middle School to Refuge Community Church. Uh, there are approximately 1,806 active voters in this precinct. The new location, Refuge Community Church, is 0.3 miles outside of Clarkdale 01 in the adjacent precinct of Cooper 01, but very close to the border of the precinct boundary line. Uh, again, the reason for this is our longstanding efforts to try and get out of schools, and um, in recent events have made that even more, um, you know, pertinent to try and get out of schools, and we are receiving a lot of comments from parents and school administrators to try and accelerate that. So we'd like to offer this as a replacement location and ask uh, the, after the public hearing for the board to approve this. Okay. Would you like me to do the other two before we open the public hearing? Yes, I think we should do them all at the same time. Okay, and you, you can see on the, the map um, the different locations there for Clarkdale 01. 
So we'll continue on to the next one, which is for Precinct Smyrna 1A. And this is, again, moving the polling place from Argyle Elementary School to Covenant Church. And um, that is, again, for the reason of trying to move out of uh, polling places out of schools. Um, <coughs> this precinct has 3827 active registered voters. And um, the elementary school is, has always been way too small for this number of voters. So uh, we do have um, this Covenant Church that is 1.4 miles uh, from the old polling location, but it is within the precinct boundaries. And you can see that on the map. Okay, thank you. Okay. The third item that we're bringing up is, um, we looked at this several months ago, I believe, but we'd like to bring it back to you again, and this is Wade Green 02. Um, we are currently in this polling place uh, with 48, uh, 4,858 4, uh, voters at uh, the Christ Harvester Global Outreach, uh, sorry, the, they're at Christ Episcopal Church now, and that church is um, considered way too small for that number of voters. So we would like to split those, especially before the November election, which is when we'll anticipate the most voters that will come to this location. Uh, this is one that we had issues in 2018, and of course 2020 was an unusual year, but now we're getting back into more of a uh, normal pattern for um, the number of people that vote early and by absentee, and so we're trying to head off a problem at this location. So what we're proposing is to split the precinct and continue part of the voters at the Christ uh, Episcopal Church and the other half go to Christ Harvester Global Outreach Ministries. And you can see on the map that um, the area in green would go to the new polling location, which is marked by a red asterisk, and the part in pink or purple will continue on at the existing location. Anything further? Um, I might have to do one more thing. <laughs> I think we'll go ahead and put up that other slide on this location just to get all of our information out of the way before you open it up. This is, uh, if you can see it all, this is an aerial view of the polling location, the, the existing polling location at the, um, the Christ Episcopal Church. And you can see the problem is really not necessarily the location <coughs> inside or the room, although the room is 41 feet by 52 feet and the number of, look, of, of equipment pieces that will be required will put them somewhat tight. It'll be about five feet between each um, carrier in that kind of a space. But the real problem is in the parking. There are 86 spaces, and um, that worked fine in this May primary because we had um, about 68 voters an hour at that location. Um, but back in 2018, we had a total of 1,627 voters vote on election day, and that was about 135 an hour. And we have 86 spaces. So people parked all over the place trying to get uh, into the poll and pretty much destroyed all of the landscaping. Uh, so we do feel that this location is not adequate for the number of voters we have here. And that's all. Anyone have questions for Ms. Avalar? I'm sorry, is Your the, mic, please. Your mic. I'm sorry, is this this related to the Wade Green? Yes, this is Wade Green. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Oh, and just so you know, all these um, boxes that are on here, I failed to mention, but those are all special signage that we have to put up there. There are um, over 10 signs that have to go up to direct people not to park on the grass and that certain areas are off limits. And so it's a, it's a massive amount of extra signage that has to go out so that we can protect our relationship with this location. So with the, with the split here, <coughs> this will suffice? Yes, because we'll end up with about half this number will be at this, uh, this yeah, current location. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I know you made mention of uh, the fact that this was brought up previously. 
if you will just remind us, we're, I mean, in each instance, the, the, pre, the uh, locations, the proposed locations are outside of the precinct boundaries. So we were not able to find anything within the boundaries. We were not. In fact, the current polling place for this um, precinct is also outside of the right. boundaries. Right. That's what I said. Both right. are outside. Right. And how long have these been voters been voting in this in this location? Um, I know prior to t uh, 2018, but 2018 is the time that we had the issues. Okay. Uh, I'll be honest. My concern is I think we're 91, 92 days prior to the election and whether it, it's going to cause confusion to voters who have just voted in uh, May and pre presumptively in June uh, during the runoff for us to change their voting location uh, a little more than three months prior to the election is, is concerning. Right. We did bring it up prior to May as well, mm -hmm. and it was not accepted at that time. So we're, we really do um, feel that this location is just not adequate for the November election. Uh, again, we tried to bring it up earlier in the year so that it would be the entire cycle at that location, but it was not accepted then either. Okay. Does anyone have any comments or questions for Ms. Eveler with regard to any of the three? That, that was the only one I had a question about. Does the uh, split of the precinct have to go to the county commission for approval? Yes, sir, it does. Okay. Th this board would be recommending it to the, the BOC, and they make final approval. Right. Okay. So the first two, which are just, are not splits, would those have to be no. approved? No. And then my recollection election is that for in each instance you're proposing that these be um, effective for the November election that's correct they would be effective immediately okay Janine my concern um, is is making changes so close to uh, our election in November does is school in session on that Tuesday Am it is I understanding not it is not for that no it is not in session, but the runoff, it is in session if there is a runoff. Okay. <coughs> Go ahead, Pat. Yeah. Anything further from Ms. Apple? Yeah. No? Okay. Is there a motion? A public hearing. Um, uh, yeah. We do have to open it. Yeah. Okay. Um, we'll go ahead and open it up for public comment or the public hearing portion. It's 411. We can likely, again, limiting to two minutes, and we need to complete hopefully this one by 430. So, are there just on the, and this is just with respect to the precinct changes and I'm limiting the comment on precinct changes to give you an opportunity to go back to public comment on everything. So, so are there any comments with respect to the proposed precinct changes as presented by Ms. Evler? Pardon? Yes, you can. This is the public hearing portion. Therefore, if you'll come forward and you'll be provided two minutes to address only the precinct changes. Only the precinct changes. And if someone will silence their phone. <laughs> yes. Good afternoon. My name is Arnold Abelman. I'm a resident of Cobb County. I've been living here since 1983. My only comment with regard to the precinct changes is that I strongly hope and suggest that adequate time is given for full communication of the changes for those people that are affected. As you had pointed out, we're getting close to the midterms, and if you're going to make these precinct changes and it's not 
adequately communicated, <clears throat> that presents a problem. I've been uh, uh, a you know, recipient of, of questions and, and taken declarations of voters uh, in past elections, and there have been a number of instances where the confusion that they had to suffer when all of a sudden, you know, they go to the go to where they think the polling station is, and only to find out that it's been moved. So, adequate communication f for their sake is what I would advocate. Okay, thank you, Mr. Thank Abelman. You. Any additional comments solely with respect to the precinct changes? I'm Sabrina Mao. I am a Cobb resident for almost 45 years. Um, every time when the precinct changes, you know, they mail us, I keep pretty much straight with my mail. And I know a lot of people don't look at their mail right away. So if you have split change, you know, people probably wouldn't know by the time they go to the vote, you know, oh, you're not supposed to vote here. So it caused a lot of confusion. So I would like recommend to stay as, you know, the way it was. So it wouldn't cause any confusion and eliminate people's ch uh, chances of voting in the right place and running back and forth, find the right place to vote. That's Thank you, ma'am. Anyone further? Yes, ma'am. Come on. So my only question about the Wade Green change is, um, Can you Janine, state, is do you mind the, stating your name? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm Catherine Flom. Um, is the Christ Harvester Global Church not large enough to handle all of the Wade Green precinct so that there would be less confusion, so that they just move all from one to a new location instead of having it split? That's my question. Thank you. Okay. Sir, you can come up. My name is Ralph Bruce, resident of Cobb County. And what I see is she's presented you with problems and solutions, and you need to go ahead and act on them. The longer you delay, there's, there's no solution in delaying, because there's always going to be a problem of when you change it, you've got to deal with it. So why don't you act? Do it and get people ready for this next election. You've got this, this split between these. You've got a situation where people are clearly being inconvenienced by having to park all over the church property. You've already delayed it out three times from what I hear. The delay is just adding to your problem. Act, please. Yes, ma'am, come on up, please. My name is Joan Hutton. I'm a resident of Cobb. Um, I thank you for this opportunity on this particular question to um, be able to voice a concern that I had and what I personally experienced and to expand on the first gentleman's comments. Um, in this past election, I received a postcard from the electoral office um, two days before the election that advised me of my polling location. Fortunately, mine did not change, but I understand others did. And the problem was, so I was like, why am I getting this two days before the election? And so I called the address, you know, the, the agency, the uh, Cobb office that sent it out, and I spoke with, um, I, I didn't even take her name because she's not the person that I have the issue with, but she said that um, that was a result of redistricting and I asked her, when was redistricting finalized? She said March 31st. And March 31st, I believe, if I recall, was the date on the postcard. So my question at the time was, why, why did it take, what, two months? Who, who was asleep at the wheel? Who forgot to send them out or did not think it was important? Again, I was not affected, but I talked to one person who was affected. So. Um, just, I'm, I'm happy to give you that input because it's on my mind ever since, so thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Hunt. Are there any other comments with respect to the polling, proposed polling changes? Go ahead, Pat. 
All right, so this is a split and it'll be permanent, right? Yes, sir. Well, then I can't see it. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay. apologies, I asked. So come on up, ma'am. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mary Jo Foster, and I've been a poll watcher several times since 2020. And in the recent uh, relocation of polling places, it did cause a lot of confusion and a lot of overwork of the poll workers because of the late notice. And I just wanted to uh, let you note that. Okay, thank, thank you, ma'am. I'm Claudia Falk again, yes. and as an area supervisor, I have several polls, and we never, ever want to see our polls change. It's a big upset to have to do that, and no change is taken lightly, and it's thoroughly researched, and all those signs, that was just a little touch of what goes on in site surveys and everything else to get a poll changed. But there's a lot of reasons for that. The schools, for safety, security reasons, wanted us out of the schools. Though we've been trying, I still have mine in one school because we just can't find another location. When we can find a location, after all the research, even if it's closer to an election, we've got to do it. We've got to get it settled for the future. We can't keep putting off stuff because it really is critical to get into a place we can stay. I know right now, I have two poles. They're churches that are doing more and more, and I think they're gonna to wanna to have us out of there. So we're gonna to have to face that too. Fortunately, it won't be this year, and we'll have time to do it before the next presidential. But it is critical when Miss Eveler, when Janine, says we need to do this. She has not taken this lightly. She has put, put uh, tons of work into it along with everybody else on the staff. And we have to pay attention to that. It's easy to say, oh no, this is gonna be trouble. And it is bad when we don't get, uh, when everybody doesn't get the notices. Well, a lot of people throw away their mail away. It's junk mail, they don't pay attention. Hardly anybody's reading the newspapers anymore. And now that they're in the mail, mine are coming late. So I'm using yesterday's news two days later because by the time I get it, it's too late. I watch the news on television. There, there are different ways people are notified of stuff, but they're not paying attention because they're playing candy something on their <laughs> cell phone. They're, they're really not paying attention. And they, listen, how old do you have to be to vote? 18? They're adults, we're adults. We have to give adults credit for making some decisions and for being accepting and Thank going you, along Ms. with Spall. something. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Pat. I, I think a lot of this though is it's communication. We're doing, I think we're doing a heck of a job. I've, I've had a couple of uh, changes of polls in my area that I check out every election time. And we're, we're talking about maybe four or five or six people that were irate out of hundreds, if not thousands. So I, I think this time is, I think we need to do it because this is gonna be a permanent. So next time, if there were a couple people that showed up at the wrong place, next time they'll be at the right place. And I don't think the numbers justify us not doing it. So that's just my opinion. Thank you. Is there anything further? We've closed the public aspect of this hearing. I understand we keep going back and forth. I asked if there were any additional comments. We do need to move on. But are there any additional comments from the board or for that matter, questions for Ms. Eveler? Hearing none, is there a motion on the floor? Tori, I, yes. would, uh, I would move to approve the relocation of the precinct Clark Dillo 1 from the Luke Garrett Middle School to the Refuge Community Church uh, and the relocation of the Precinct Smyrna 1A Argyle Elementary School Covenant Church, as well as uh, the proposed division of Wade Green to form Wade Green 01 and 02. But uh, I would like each of these changes to become effective January 1st. 
Okay. And I'll second it. Okay. So it's been moved and properly seconded to approve each of the proposed changes. Um, first and foremost to Clarkdale 01, next to Smyrna 1A, and the proposed division of Wade Green 02 into Wade Green 02 and Wade Green 01. However, those proposed changes would become effective January 1, 2023. It's been um, moved and properly seconded. If you'll register your vote, if you're in approval. Okay, it's, it passes unanimously. So the changes will become effective Jan 1, 2023. Good job, thank you. So at this point, the next item on the agenda are the uh, challenge hearings. Um, admittedly, we are going to revise the agenda and take up the um, advanced in-person voting uh, options first. And we are going to reopen public comment as I suggested that I would because we're ahead of the proposed schedule. So at this point, let's go back to where we stopped. We stopped with a Miss Lisa Thomas. Next up is a Paul Dalber. And again, Mr. Am I saying that correctly? Diber. Diber. Um, and if you'll just again note the two minute limit and um, we'll try to get through everyone. We've got seven individuals that had signed up remaining to speak. We'll go through everyone, again, giving everyone the opportunity to be heard, and then we'll continue with the balance of the agenda. Go ahead, Mr. Diber. Hi, I'm Paul Diber. I'm a poll worker here in Cobb County. So imagine you are with a sibling and your parent dies, and the whole extended family gets to vote of which of you two gets all the money. So you would want each person to have only one vote, and you both are going to want to check to make sure that happens. And you're both going to want to make sure that the vote count is correct. So this is as personal as that feels. That's how it is for all of us voters. We want to know that each person had one vote and each person's vote was counted correctly. The, the, comp, the system is so complex, we don't get that satisfaction. Um, what we what we want then is to minimize the chances for fraud. And the Republican Party has poll watchers, as many as they can get, on all these drop boxes and voting locations. And when, if we were to increase the number beyond what the Republicans can monitor, then that would introduce the ability for fraud. And the fraud is real. I don't, have, have you all watched 2,000 Mules? I mean, that's real data. If you go to voterga.org, that's real data. You can see that the voter fraud is a real problem, and, and we just want to stop it. Now, you all are under a lot of intimidation. I was just at the Cherokee County Board of Elections meeting, and they were coerced, literally coerced, by Raffensperger's type lawyers there. And, uh, and I just want you all to stand up and do the right thing and, and not succumb to pressures that might hurt you. Okay, thank you, bye. Thank you, Mr. Diver. Nancy Jo Kirk. My name is Nancy Jo Kirk and I am a resident of Cobb County and I would very much like to thank the Board of Elections for the integrity that you have assured us in Cobb County so that we can be confident that our votes are safe and accurate and thank you very much. I would like to, uh, I would have the hope that we could have a day of Sunday voting so that uh, people can be assured of some extra time to vote uh, for some people who are not as fortunate as others of us who can get to the uh, voting place um, uh, for more t for on, on other days, the days of the, the regular days of the week. A uh, democratic republic is strongest when as many citizens as possible get a chance to register their opinions and to vote. And so that's what we want to assure is that the 
citizens of, of the United States, in this case the citizens of Cobb County, get a chance to vote. And Sunday voting could be a help. And I would like to second uh, the remarks that were made by the person. Um, I have a little bit of concern about people pointing uh, to Sunday as a, uh, uh, a day, a Sabbath day. And that is not the case for everybody. We have to make sure that we remember that we do have freedom of religion in this country so that we pay attention to all those different people. And again, thank you for this opportunity to speak. Thank you, Ms. Kirk. Is it San Sandra Burdart? I'm sorry, ma'am, what's your, your name, please? My name is Sandra Burkhart. Burkhart, got it, go ahead. This, <clears throat> excuse me, the position this board has taken on issues and decisions of this board concern many. It appears that you are not in favor of transparent elections and honest audits, plus your efforts to prevent ineligible people being removed from voter rolls make Cobb County a viable county for the Georgia State Election Board to investigate elections here. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Burkhart. Marie Borowski. Good afternoon, neighbors. Thank you for your time. Um, recently, there was a Vinings precinct, precinct hand recount, which resulted in quite different uh, results from the tabulation. So uh, it, it brings all tabulation under suspicion. Um, I'm really here for one question f uh, f to all of you. and. Um, I just really want to know if you personally endorse transparency, and this is a yes, no, or I refuse to answer to all of you, um, Tori. At this time, this is public hearing. This is a time that we hear from you all, and we're not obligated to answer any questions, and that should not be taken as a yes, no, or I don't know, but that's not how this goes. Continue, ma'am. Um, secondarily, uh, I believe that if you are going to put your ballot in the mailbox, then there's really no reason for the extra expense of um, resources and manpower. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Borowski. Marie Kirkland Ellis? Or is it Maxie? Maxie. I apologize. Good afternoon. Thank you, Madam Chair, and to the other Board of Election members. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Again, my name is Maxie Kirk Williams. I am a resident of Cobb County, and I do study the issues before I cast my vote in every election. What I came here today is to share with you that I am a contractor. I work for myself. When I go out of town on a Monday morning, I come back late Friday. I take care of business on Saturday for my family. Sunday voting would be very helpful instead of losing a day that I have to go to work. Um, Sunday voting would be helpful for me because I would not lose days to go to work when I do have a contract job. Adding a day for me is personal and it would help me. On behalf of the legal men voters of which I am a president here in Merida Cobb and the board did ask me to come and speak on our behalf. Our members also have always asked and pushed for extra days of voting. Sunday is important. We understand if there is additional funding available, if there is any way that you can support weekend voting, we ask that you do so. We also suggest that you consider having weekend voters and not just the 7 by 7 by 21. That is a lot for anyone to do. But please consider adding a weekend shift of voters and allow us to volunteer to work in those shifts. Thank you for my time. Thank you, Ms. Williams. George Balbona. Hello. 
My name is George Balbona. I'm a citizen of, a uh, resident of Marietta. And uh, I'll be brief. I know that's the first one. I wasn't going to come here at all, but uh, oddly enough, I came because uh, Cobb County Republican Party posted on Facebook. <laughs> that's why I'm here. Um, it says, no surprise the fair fight Warnock and Abrams are continuing their narrative voting, of voting suppression. Notice they didn't say false, because it isn't false. And they're here telling everybody to come to this meeting to vote no to Sunday voting. And they're also saying there's only 12 speakers, they're going to be allowed to vote, you know, talk for five minutes, obviously, as, uh, before you change the agenda. And so say, say no to vote, vote Sunday voting. So when Sally comes up here and asks, you know, just says, oh, all these people are saying no, you know, are coming up here to say no to Sunday voting because Abrams and Warnock and Fair Fight are saying there's suppression. You guys are doing it, the Republicans are doing it too. I mean, come on. I just want fair, secure, transparent elections. Right here, she, someone said, maybe I don't know who wrote this, if we don't fight back, they win. Oh, now we're they. It's us versus them. That's really not good. We got to see that there's more than black and white here. There's shades of gray. Uh, the system we use is abysmal and has been for years since before we got into this boondoggle of $150 million. And it's way more than that because all these counties, and you know it, are locked into pricing that is just vampiric. They jack up the rates of everything three to four times. And some counties aren't as, as affluent as Cobb that can afford it. And when you want to know why I oppose the, this uh, voting machine system, not because I'm a member of the Kraken crew, not because I want to overturn any election results. I, before they even used them, I was against them. And it's because the man who like, literally came up with risk-limiting audits, his name is uh, Professor Philip Stark, wrote a letter to Brad Raffensperger saying, there is not a valid paper trail. You cannot have a good- Thank you, Mr. Balbona. Thank you. We appreciate you. Glad to see you, you're new. I am new. Been bound for about a year. Well, go. Next up. Are you on that list? <coughs> what? We resumed on the list, and, and you've had your opportunity to speak via public comment. Thank you. Gary, and your last name starts with a P? Yes. Starting the clock, I would ha met, have a I parliamentary apologize. inquiry. May I, I apologize for just one moment. If you could just state your name. My I name, I'm sorry. My name is Gary Pelfrey. You can remember it as Bats in the Belfry. I uh, am quite proud of the name Bats. My classmates know me as that. I have a parliamentary inquiry as to procedure. Certainly. Please go right ahead. How, how do we get our prepared remarks made a part of the record? And to what extent are the remote speakers' comments a part of the record, as well as the handout which the board all received? How do those become a part of the record? When you say a part of the record, Miss um, Mossbacher <coughs> is taking minutes, and that's one of the reasons why we inquire as to who is speaking, such that it can be noted who's speaking. So any comments that are made via uh, the virtual connection or here, now, with regard to your written comments, you take someone like a Mr. Boyd Parks, he emailed us his comments, but then he also arrived here this afternoon and spoke his comments into the record. Are those not sufficient? How, I guess, what, how, how do you believe your comments are not going to be a part of the record, or why? Let me speak first to the handout that was given you. Is that going to be a part of the record available to the rest of the citizens to see? I believe it was the chairman of the Cobb Republican it, Party. Well, he was asking, I understand it's not a question and answer period because it, he was asking more around procedure, and I definitely understand that. He's, he's speaking to procedure. Um, I mean, to the, it, this happens all, well, not all the time, but it does happen frequently when there is a speaker and they would like the board to consider something in connection with listening to their comments. They provide that to us. I, I, I'm sorry, I did see the director of communications here. I believe when I see it up there, it's going to be a part of the television record of this meeting. And, yes. And so my question is, how do these physical documents come in? And since the people on Zoom were not video, are their comments part of it as well? 
I, I, I asked yes, the board, sir. Uh, you, you, you have a time constraint, and I, I'll I ask do, you to consider it. And or we do. <laughs> I would further point out, if I might. I apologize, sir. Are you transitioning to your comments? Have we concluded no, I, your procedural questions? I, yes. I would like to suggest to the court, I apologize for speaking earlier. Your definition of public comment and mine are obviously different, and yours certainly prevails here. I would like to point out that the reaction I would have expected when I saw a crowd of 81 people showing up here 92 days before the election to say, boy, get the takeout menus. We may be here all night. And I, sir, I, I absolutely understand that. There are things that are not within our control. Um, Ms. Evler, please confirm for me that we were advised that we only have this meeting room from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. In the, in the absence of that restraint, a restraint that none of us can control, we absolutely could have had the takeout menus. Madam Chairman, may I point out that we are connected by a covered bridge to a full parking lot that we can use all night if and, we need to. And then those individuals that you were so concerned about their comments being a part of the record, there's no way that we would have been able to have them continue in, as a part of this proceeding virtually if we were outside in the parking garage. It just wouldn't have been possible. So I, that's I, where we are. I, I'm, there I, are certain constraints that are beyond me. I'm, I'm prepared to make my statement and submit my written documents for inclusion, if I might. You may go ahead, Thank sir. You. Starting I, your time I now. Am, I am here, quite frankly, because I signed on the website today with only two questions. And I understand you're not in a position to answer questions, but I think these are important questions and vital questions. And there is no answer I have found, either from your website or the Secretary of State. The two questions are, what is your mission? And the next question is, what are your goals? I understand you're not prepared to answer those questions, but what scares me to death is the fact that there are no written answers to those questions, and they are vital in this world we're in now. I'd like to take a brief minute and talk about something I know more about than the election process, and I selected baseball. In baseball, we have umpires. And the question I would ask you five is, do you consider yourselves umpires or recruiters? Umpires make the rules and enforce them and worry about where to change polling places, et cetera. And that's a very important factor. Unfortunately, the way we are today, in a baseball game, we have a pitcher who is always throwing that high, hard, fast one right at the batter's head because he has no rules. And so as umpires, you can stand there and call ball four and load the bases all you want, and you'll never get that man to stop ignoring the rules. So I think you need to strongly consider changing your role from umpires to recruiters. Do everything you can, I would suggest, as the answer to the two questions I posed you, that your mission ought to be to conduct the most effective, efficient, widespread possible way to get every registered voter to vote. Thank and you. I would submit Thank as you, the goal, Thank your you. goal should be to get. Thank you very much. You've exceeded your two minutes, sir. I appreciate you. Thank you. Chairwoman, may I make a clarification? There is actually another meeting that starts at 6. So we would need exactly. to be complete before. Hence the reason why we've, uh, why there appears to be this rushing, if you will, there again, there are things that are not within this board's control, not within Ms. Evler's control. We are working within the confines that have been presented to us. Um, at this point, public comment is con has been concluded and we will move on to the next item on the agenda. I did note that we were going to reverse the items on the agenda such that Ms. Evler will now present the options for advanced in-person voting. Thank you. So in your agenda, you'll see the uh, proposed schedule of in-person advanced voting. 
We have a total of 12 locations. A 13th location is added on the last week. And we are proposing voting 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. on weekdays and 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. on both Saturdays. Our proposal includes the maximum number of drop boxes at our main office and five other locations, as that is the most number of drop boxes that the law allows us to have. And we are proposing that our new office at 995 Roswell Street be the main office location. Uh, secondarily, there is a map showing the geographic distribution of those locations and this somewhat central location of Jim Miller Park to be open for the last week. It appears in a different color. The uh, stars indicate drop box locations and the blue dots indicate those uh, locations that will be open the entire three weeks and two Saturdays. Um, I would like to address, oh, thank you, CP. I would also like to address um, the idea of Sunday voting, which is not on our proposal um, for many of the reasons that have been brought up by uh, some of our poll workers, uh, not at our instigation, but uh, of their own volition. They came to speak about how difficult it is to staff on Sunday and the wear and tear that happens over a three-week period of um, voting in advance. So if you would start that slide, the first slide, CP. Now this uh, was sent to, out to the board. I did take a look at some data, which I know the board appreciates to have some data to make the, their decisions. And I looked at the four uh, counties in the metro area, three of which are uh, currently doing some for, portion of Sunday voting. Uh, and this is from the May 24th general primary. Um, DeKalb had reduced hours during the weekends, but Fulton and Gwinnett had the same hours throughout all 17 days, including <coughs> Saturdays and Sundays. So I feel that Fulton and Gwinnett are a good case study to see how um, advanced voting diminishes in public response on the Sundays. And so you can see in just these numbers and the percentages of, of voters, of, of the total number of voters, that even though the poll is open the entire same number of hours at, at each of their polling locations, the public demand for in some cases Saturday, but definitely for Sunday, drops down significantly. Um, I'd like to also look at the next slide as we take a little bit closer look at this. This is for Fulton, and this is sorted by percent of total vote. And you can see that the least used days are both of the Sundays. And even though they were open eight to six, just like every other day, the voters did not respond by using that opportunity to vote in nearly the same way that they did in other days, especially weekdays. The third least used day was the first Saturday, but of course that is a required day, so I'm not proposing that that goes away, but this just gives you an idea of which days are most popular or you know, bring in the, no, the main number of voters. And of course, as has been mentioned by uh, several of our speakers, the last day is always the most popular day just because people do wait until the last day. If you'll go to the next slide, CP. This is the same sort of look at Gwinnett County. And Gwinnett County had the most opportunity for people to vote as they use 7 a.m. to 7 p.m for every single day. And again, the least number of, of use by voters was the first Sunday. In this case, the first Saturday was their second least used day, and their second Sunday was the third least used days. And I propose these, or I show this, to, to let you all know by data that when you offer these opportunities, they are not taken advantage of at the same rate as other dates. And with our reduced number of resources, as, as we've <coughs> talked about, it is very difficult to hire people, especially during the early voting period where 
people are getting very tired during the, the period. And when you have a limited number of resources, you need to put those resources where they can produce the best result. And our proposed schedule is to put our resources in the days that we know that we can take care of the most voters or what, what is shown in the data that most voters want to vote and do vote. So um, if, if the board wants additional uh, opportunities in this schedule, we would prefer that we extend the Saturday hours first as our first um, volley into extending more, expanding more if that's what the board wishes, but that we um, limit those, that, those Sundays because that is the day that our workers uh, use to rest and um, many have said that they will not work on Sunday. Um, and we have a hard enough time scheduling on other days. So um, that is just a, a look at some statistics for you. And um, I would be happy to answer any questions that you have on our proposed schedule. Does anyone have questions? I have questions, but I'll defer to others. OK. Um, as was alluded to earlier, there are often times individuals reach out to us. Um, you know, Mr. Parks kindly reached out to us to provide his comments in advance. A number of items have been brought to our attention, or at least people have inquired, uh, inquired about them. Um, specifically, Whitlock, I actually believe someone made mention of that here today. Can you address uh, the situation with the prior main office location? Yes, so as has been announced, our office has moved to um, the 995 Roswell Street to a new facility that was um, renovated in such a way that we feel it is uh, a, a better experience for voters. It's a better experience for us as administrators to um, administer voting at that location. We do have a few challenges that we need to address at that location, but we prefer to have uh, the main office voting at our main office so that we have staff support there for registration questions, um, <coughs> for additional uh, support. If we, if we get busy, we can bring people in. And um, there has been some proposal that we continue voting at the Whitlock location instead. Uh, but that would entail being another satellite location. So we would uh, not have our staff support there. We would not have registration there to uh, deal with any registration issues. And it would be just really another satellite location. So our preference is to go ahead and move to the no lo new location, which was designed in such a way that it will have indoor line management instead of out in the parking lot and other uh, security measures that are not present at the old location. We won't be, um, because we're all in one, lo in one facility, we won't be moving um, a lot of things back and forth to the other location. Um, and we just feel like it is a better solution that we go ahead and, as somebody said, rip the Band-Aid off and go ahead and, and vote at the new location. Okay. Since we're on the Whitlock, I just think it would be good for everybody's benefit to just explain really quickly what we're going to do at Whitlock to make sure that voters know about the new location. Yes, thank you. Our plan would be to have staff there so that if anybody does go to that location, we can direct them to the new facility. Um, at Whitlock, as, as you all remember, the tax commissioner and tax assessor and Safe Path and Crimes Against Persons, uh, Crimes Against Children are all in that facility. And there are conflicting uh, traffic patterns and you know people coming to pay taxes and so it is a combined use building that it will be much better to have us at the other building um, but we will we do realize that people out of habit will go to that facility so we would have people there to direct the voters and Janine we would not have a drop box the drop box at, is at required Whitmore. to be at our main office so regardless of where we have that voting take place, we have to have the drop box as our, at our main office. And we have already maxed out our, according to our advanced voting location, 
um, flyer. We've maxed out the number of drop, of drop boxes. boxes. Yes, um, we're we can have we're required to have one at our main office, and then by population, we can have one drop box by every hundred thousand um, people voters. And we have just over 500,000 voters, so we can have five additional. I think I'd like to, again, make it on record. We've got six drop boxes. Everybody has, a, as has been stated here, everybody has a drop box at the end of their driveway. We can mail it in, and we don't really need these drop boxes. I really believe that, and I think, well, thank you. But my point is, if you really want to vote, you can vote already. Oh, I appreciate that. I was just, I just wanted to. I understand. Sure I'm we, sorry. We had, yeah, we had maxed out our number. Okay. We had maxed out our number. But we got a couple that, million that, drop allowed, boxes around allowed, the county. That's allowed by law. We, we have the maximum number. Right. De I, deployed. I, I absolutely agree with Jessica to the extent that individuals have noted that we need to increase the number of drop boxes. That's not something we can legally do. Um, at this point beyond what's presently provided for as set forth on um, this agenda. Uh, with regard to what will take place at Whitlock to ensure, because obviously that's a very long-standing location that a large number of Cobb County residents are, are um, familiar with and registered voters are familiar going there voting. So in addition to there being, uh, you said you'll have staff there, are you proposing, are you planning any other measures to ensure that if someone shows up at Whitlock, they are being provided, whether it be instructions, directions, a list of other locations that they can go to? What are your, or you and your staff's plans around that? Yes, um, so we would be giving them the flyer that has other locations rather than just saying, you, you know, go ahead and go over to the new location. Um, maybe they only have that short period of time and so they don't have time to go to another location but they're going to need another uh, a flyer to see where else they can go on a different day looking at other you know other dates that are available so we would give them the flyer we would post signs at the location as well so that they don't even get up to the the workers that they see those signs we're also going to be doing a big pr push you know as far as letting folks know in, in social media and the newspapers. We are, um, this is a good time to, to let everybody know, we are gonna have an open house and ribbon cutting at our new location on September 10th, starting at 11 o'clock. So um, we're gonna try and make a big fanfare out of moving. Um, I happen to be around at the time when we moved to the Whitlock location from our old uh, location on Waddell. And folks, found it just fine. <laughs> um, you know, it was it was already a big deal that we were moving to a new facility, and so um, there there weren't problems with people going back to the Waddell Street location and looking for voting there. Mm -hmm. okay. Could I ask further questions about the, the function of the um, employees who, who might be there, um, the, the thoughts about the time? Because we piloted registrars being at some of our libraries, at one point, and I'm just wondering whether our um, voters would be able to drop off absentee ballots. Is, is, was that part of our plan? Um, I mean, so I that, that would be a different topic, but that is um, in relation to drop boxes. As you said, there is a limited number of drop boxes that we are allowed to have out there. Um, at the, as I think I said um, several years ago, um, when we were first talking about the new change, that um, having a drop box is just a, a receptacle instead of a person taking your ballot because any voter can bring their absentee mail ballot to any voting location and, and give it to the, the workers that are there. And then we have staff that comes around and picks up the ballots and brings them back to the office. Um, so having a drop box just means that there's an, a different receptacle, but the poll workers there are taking ballots no matter if there's a drop box or not. And in relation to your other question about um, libraries and that pilot project that we did, we are going to um, try and implement that again uh, on this election where because these uh, drop boxes and locations are accepting ballots only during the advanced voting period, on the Friday before the election that all stops. 
So on the Saturday, which is that next day, and then the Monday prior to the election, people don't really have an opportunity to mail their ballot at that point because it's too late to get to us. And there's no dropping off any of the at any of these locations. So what we want to do is put our staff, the registrars, deputy registrars, at several different libraries around the county on those two dates to accept absentee ballots. So that puts us all the way up to election day. Okay. Um, have you all considered placing a map? I just map quested it. It looks to be about 13 minutes, at least based upon current travel times and about four miles between the previous main office and the, uh, the new main office. So, you know, just blowing up a map again, I, I just believe, I personally believe it's important because okay. we are so close to an election. Um, and for the most part, earlier during this proceeding, we deferred making changes effective in this election cycle. And obviously we can't get around this particular uh, precinct or this recent location change, but I think we need to undertake as many tactics, as many means as we can to ensure that uh, we provide information to registered voters that show up to vote and give them every opportunity to make an informed decision as to whether they can make it to this current, this new mm -hmm. location, or for that matter, even as you prepare that list of um, other locations that they can go to, perhaps even putting in parent, a parenthetical the number of miles it is from Whitlock. I just think that, again, we need to do as much as we can to be as informative as possible. Okay, great. Anything further with regard to um, the advance voting schedule related to Whitlock? May I ask something? Not at this time, no ma'am, I apologize. I know Janine has provided a, is there anything further? No. no. Okay. Um, Janine, you've provided a, a significant amount of information with respect to Sunday advance, uh, adding a, an additional day Sunday. Um, thank you, first and foremost, for being proactive and providing that information to us. Um, as Maid mentioned earlier, there have been a number of individuals that have reached out to us on a number of topics. And one of those, um, obviously, is with respect to um, Sunday voting. And so I do want to open, because you introduced it by bringing it up, the individuals that have reached out to us have introduced it by bringing it up. I want to go ahead and give my colleagues and myself an opportunity to uh, address any questions, comments, or concerns. And ma'am, I was not attempting to be rude to you. There is an opportunity for public hearing in this aspect. As soon as we conclude this portion, we'll go to that and you'll have an opportunity to speak. So at this point, any comments, concerns, Sunday voting? Oh, and specifically Sunday voting. Yes. Well, I do want to introduce the, the option and the possibility. Um, obviously, you know that I've reached out to you, um, Janine, with respect to Sunday voting. And if you'll share um, the information that you provided to me with regard to the prospect of having Sunday voting at the main office, I think that would be helpful. Uh, Chairwoman asked how much it would cost to have uh, Sunday voting at one location from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. And I assumed that the location would be our Roswell Street main office. Um, that was not clear in the request, but I <coughs> went ahead and uh, did the stats for that. And um, we come up with a total of 38 people that would be required uh, positions. So if we shared shifts, we would need to double that, basically. And the cost of those positions would be $4,765.60. Um, of course, not including utilities or any of the facility type expenses, that's just personnel. Right, but those facility expenses, perhaps they 
it's not an additional cost because we're to um, because we're not going out and we're not using a church or we're not using another facility where we'd have to pay a facility fee per se. Correct. Oh uh, yeah, we we haven't paid any facility fees for early voting at any of our locations. I'm just speaking about utilities and things like that. To the extent you're on, there on a Sunday, when whereas you wouldn't yeah. otherwise be there. Yeah. Other questions, comments, concerns here? So we're talking about, you said how many members that would have to be working? That would be 30, 38. 33, is that 38. overtime then? For, uh, these? for some people it would be overtime. I did not calculate that in because it depends on whether it's a full-time person or it's a uh, part-time person. They may not be in overtime. Right, thank you. So I know if there's nothing further from the board, um, This, yeah, this isn't really public hearing. Like, I apologize, ma'am. I wanted to give you that opportunity to talk, but this is not a part of the public hearing. So, again, I apologize. Um, I think at this point we'll entertain any motions um, on the floor with regard to the advanced, advanced voting. I'm at, I'm at, that we go with uh, that Janine put together. Make a motion that. Uh, the uh, schedule that Janine put together, so we vote on that. Mm -hmm. Is there a second? Be being no second, the uh, motion fails. Is there an additional, and recognizing that this must be approved as promptly as possible so that Janine and her staff can begin to prepare, um, is there a motion on the floor with regard to the in-person advanced voting options? I would like to um, move to approve the November in-person advanced voting schedule um, subject to two revisions um, because I don't believe the original schedule actually included what you shared with us about Whitlock and, and making that a place. I'd like to just for the, for the first revision to say, um, I'd like for us to make sure that we have posting of signage that's sufficient. Um, at the elections office, that Whitlock office, previous location, um, to direct voters to, to alternative polling, advanced in-person voting locations that, as, as we discussed, you know, with adequate signage and, and information, perhaps the maps, um, as well as information about distance and um, other advanced voting locations. Um, the second, um, revision that I would like to move um, to approve involves expanding um, the date and times for advance in-person voting so that we actually do have the new main office open on Sunday from 11 until 4. Just one Sunday and that would be Sunday the 30th. Uh, maybe from 12, 12 until 4 maybe. 12 until 4. You pay for it? Cup Pat. Is there a second? Second. Okay. It's, it's been moved and properly seconded to approve the proposed in person advance voting options with two, subject to two revisions, such that the um, exclusion or us not proposing that Whitlock be among these locations, that there be sufficient um, information provided to the voters such that they are directed to the main location as it's presently on 99, at 995 Roswell Road or one of the other locations and to add um, Sunday voting on October the 30th uh, between the hours of 11 uh, a.m. and 4 p.m. And I actually changed that to 12. Oh, I'm sorry, 12 noon to 4 p.m. All of those in favor, or for the matter, those that are opposed, if you'll register your, um, your votes. Okay. The motion passes. Pardon me. Pardon me, ma'am. If you, and I appreciate if you will escort her out. That's rude, and we're not doing that here. We're not doing it. I've said it multiple times. We're not doing that here.
Moving on to the next item on the agenda, we'll go back to the uh, proposed challenges. So for those of you um, that were pre previously here, there were a certain number of challenges that we took up on July the 11th. Uh, we indicated that there's certain minimal amounts of information we required to receive to be well informed to even make take a position on those challenges. In addition to that, in the interim period, we've received a, a, an additional number of challenges. And at this point, we want to take those up. I note that some of those challengers are, I believe each of them are here, Mr. Asta, Ms. Asta, and Mr. Williams. Okay, got it. We've reviewed the information and I just wanted to kind of go over a couple of things um, based upon Janine and her staff having provided some research to us. Uh, just for purposes of this conversation or this portion of the agenda, uh, there are a total of 163 uh, electors that are subject to challenge uh, for discussion today. 161. Oh, I'm sorry, 161. Thank you. And I believe of those 161, a number of them again were t the the challenge was tabled um, during our last meeting and are being considered, a uh, portion of them are being considered today. Janine, I believe you've shared information with us, noting that uh, approximately 19 individuals that received the notices came back to us and suggested that they wanted to be removed from the rolls. Anything that where the voter sent back a request has been processed. Okay. And that would be noted on the spreadsheets that I gave you. Exactly. And so just to, for Ms. Uh, Asta, Mr. Williams, and Mr. Asta, there are certain um, challengers we're just not going to take up today because those individuals have come back to us and shared information that they wanted to re be removed. So of the 161 that we would be taking up, otherwise taking up today, 19 of those individuals we will not address because they have been removed from the role already based upon contacting Ms. Evler's office. Yes, happy to, to we're not gonna be able to do it in here because we've gotta get out, but absolutely. I just want you to be aware of why, we're, uh, why the numbers are the way they are. Next up, there are approximately, based upon the information provided to us, there are approximately 99 individuals that have been noted as inactive. So at the time that you presented your challenge to us and at the time that we took that challenge up in the first instance on July 11th, in the intervening time frame, the Secretary of State, the State of Georgia, has gone and marked those individuals inactive on the, um, on the voter roll, at least with regard to those that we tabled. In addition to that, there are a number of individuals that were part of Mr. Williams. The challenge that you submitted, I believe, on the 21st, and the challenge that uh, July 21st, and the challenge that you submitted, Ms. Um, Asta, on the 22nd. Those the, a number of those individuals are already marked as inactive on the voter roll, and so based upon our reading of section 235 of the Georgia Code, which specifically addresses the inactive list of electors, there is language that specifically requires the state of Georgia to allow those individuals to remain on the list. And I'm gonna provide you with the section reference, section 235, so it's 21-2-235, subsection B as in boy, <coughs> and it reads in pertinent part. An elector placed on the inactive list of electors shall remain on such list until the day after the second November general election held after the elector is placed on the inactive list of electors. 
the reading of my reading of this, and I open it up obviously to commentary from my colleagues, is that once the Secretary of State, the state of Georgia, has placed an, a voter or a, an elector on this inactive list, per this, per my reading of this provision, they shall remain on there. And no exception is provided in section uh, two that is provided in exception, section 235. So with regard to those 99 individuals that are noted as inactive, and again, I, we'll come down and we'll sit down and we'll share with you this information, but I just want you to have it and, and it be addressed in this public forum. Those 99 individuals that are noted as inactive, 99 electors that are noted as inactive, we are not taking any position on those. We're, or for that matter, we're, we're declining to remove them. We're declining your challenge because, again, the Secretary of State, per the code, it has to, those individuals must remain on that inactive list. In addition to that, one individual um, that was noted as being registered in the state of Florida is inactive in the state of Florida. So we're not taking a position. I, my suggestion is that we don't take a position on that. And then we also, based upon the information that I believe you provided, Ms. Asta, as well as you, Mr. Will, Mr. Williams, there are 29 individuals among those 161 that have voted in either 2020 or in 2022 outside of the state of Georgia. The suggestion here would be that we would remove those individuals so we would uphold your, um, uphold your challenge with regard to those individuals. So that's the data that we have, that's the information that we have, and then there is, um, there are 13 individuals that don't fall in those other categories. And based upon the research that I've done, um, to remove those individuals would be contrary and in conflict of the National Voters' Rights Act. And I have section references for you um, in that instance as well. So this is the data that, um, that based upon what Janine has provided to us, based upon my review of the law, this is the information that we have. I uh, want to open it up, obviously, for any comment, commentary of uh, my college. Pardon? Yes, absolutely. From us, and then obviously we'll invite the challengers up. I do note that the time is 5.15. I'm fairly certain it's 5.45, a sufficient time. We've got to be out of here in 30 minutes. Again, that's not by our, our doing. That's by the fact that there is a schedule. So, um, Mr. Williams, Mr. and Mrs. Asta, you're more than welcome to come forward, ask any questions you have about the information. I apologize for the hurried kind of presentation, but we are under time constraints. But please come above, come, come up, and um, I don't know whether you all have any comments or questions. Good afternoon. My name is Henry Asta. I'm a registered voter in Cobb County. And I have no idea whatsoever uh, what, uh, without being provided details, I have no idea whatsoever what questions to ask or not to ask. And I'm happy to provide you with those details. What we did was we took the information that you provided to us. And we looked and saw that individuals have been noted as inactive per, this Georgia's, per Georgia's standard maintenance process. And I'm happy to, I mean, some of this information, we, we, go ahead. Why, you, can we tell me where, I submitted seven, and can you tell me on each of those seven where, where, where they are? They were all active in Georgia a few days ago, and they were all active in their new states, and that data has been provided to you. So, um, but without specifics, I have no idea what, what we're even talking about here. Certainly. Mr. Asta, there are seven individuals. Do you have your listing? Yes. Okay. Uh, Mr. Clay Brooks? Yes. As confirmed by Ms. Evler's office, is presently noted as inactive 
on the state of Georgia MVP site. Okay, well that's, Is that that, that's a very recent, that must be a very recent event then. Ms. Evler, when did you, when did you review this? Uh, sometime last week. Yeah, late last week. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's something that's just happened. Right, and that and that's the whole point. Okay, uh, we How are about the next we one, are doing what we're we're required to by the code, but there is a process by which the state undertakes these things. But the next one, sir, is uh, Andrew James Hinkle. He is presently noted as inactive. He, okay, again, that just just happened in the last few days. The next one, Jennifer Louise Hinkle. <coughs> Presently noted as inactive. Okay, again, that's just happened. I understand, sir. Okay. And so, based upon what I shared a few moments ago, the what, per the Georgia Code, individuals that are noted or placed on the inactive list shall remain on that inactive list until um, and, the and November. How, how did they get placed on the inactive list? The Secretary of State under Section 234, or the State of Georgia under Section 230 of the four of the code, conducts periodic maintenance. Jump in here, Daniel, if I'm misstating anything. Correct? Can I ask him a question? Let's, let's finish here first. How, how did they get placed on the inactive list? Well, we're in the middle of regular list maintenance yeah, right now. Like, actually, that process began in June. Yes. Uh, on... Um, August 4th was the last date by which uh, the voters had a chance to uh, respond to their confirmation letter. Uh, the letters were sent out or the notices were sent out asking the voters whether they were still at that address. And if they did not respond, then they became inactive. According to, and that's the state process. That's not anything that we do. So the state registered them as inactive. The that's, state nothing, under that's nothing that was done here? No, the state un the state undertakes periodic maintenance on the voter rolls. Don't, don't they do it every two years? They don't do it on an election year. They they are currently they in are the currently middle of doing listening. it. Well, they 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 do it every off election year. They do every second year. They do that. Then why is it being done in an election year? You have to ask the state, sir. Who, who in the state? Secretary Secretary of State or the elections office of the Secretary of State. They uh, decided they wanted to clean up the rolls before the November election, so they embarked on this process. It normally does happen in the odd years, but it can happen any time as long as there's 90 days prior. Uh, at the conclusion of the list maintenance process, it's, it happens 90 days prior to an election. And the next, the next person, please. That was it on, as far as the individuals that were on your list. Okay, so what happened to the other four? The other four, they are noted as active um, presently. However, under the National Voter Register, pardon me, the National Voters Rights Act, we do not have the ability to remove them. And I let me read in pertinent part. Section 2507 of Title 52, also known as the National Voter Rights Act, reads as follows. A state shall not remove the name of a registrant from the official list of eligible voters in elections for federal office on the ground that that registrant has changed residence unless the registrant, A, confirms in writing that the registrant has changed residence to a place outside the registrar's jurisdiction in which the registrant is registered, or B, has failed to respond to a notice described in paragraph two of this code, and it's the typical notice that you provide that uh, Janine, Ms. Eveler just made mention to, and has not voted or appeared to vote, and if necessary, correct the registrar's record of the registrant's address in an election during the period beginning on the date of the notice and ending on the day after the date of the second general election for federal office that occurs after that date. Lots of words there, but we are, this, we are not in a position to rule or to provide, uphold a challenge because to do so would cause us to be in violation of the National Voters' Right so Registration despite, Act. So despite the legal assurances from your attorney 
who, who assured us that if we provided the five things that you requested, that we would have, we should have every confidence, I think those were his words, that we should have every confidence that they would be removed from the voter rolls. So, you, so we're, we're going back on that now. No, we're not going back on it. I so actually, his assurances weren't right, correct. Sir, I actually went back and I listened to our three-hour meeting, and it was specifically stated that we would take, at a minimum, this is the type of information we would need to take up, assess, and or consider <clears throat> a challenge. So is there any circumstance where, the, where a voter can be removed from the rolls? Not to the extent that federal what, what, law, federal, what, pardon, federal law supersedes state law in this instance. So that's something to be taken up by the legislature. Okay, so, so all, all challenges are, are for naught then, is that correct? No, no sir, I didn't say that because there are 29 individuals of the 161 that we have confirmed. Because we had the assurances of the attorney last meeting that if we provided you the five things, that we had sure. every confidence that there would be immediate action taken. Mr. Asta, you actually, on these seven, didn't resubmit the data. So we're just basically going by these, I, yeah, I did the inactive. I re did resubmit them, ma'am, to Janine, and I'll, each of you got a copy. Because we don't have the full date of birth for three of them, for Jackie and Joseph Jen and Judith McStravick. So we don't ha we didn't even have the five points of data on those. And then there's three that are in uh, The summary that was provided to Janine well before this meeting concluded every bit of information, the full birth dates, the, the uh, address, all the information, the five things that the attorney assured us that if we provide it to this board would be satisfactory and we could have every confidence that these voters would be immediately removed. I just think it should be, needs to be clear to uh, public record here that that's, that that's what you're saying because it sounds like no, there is no bar that we can clear to have a voter removed. That's what you're telling us. What what I told you, and I'm happy, we can all take a look at the, the tape. It's a probably the two minute, 52 second point at last, me, last month's meeting is that if you were, we needed to provide, have some semblance, some kind of bar of information to provide to us. Because if not, you could just provide anything and say, hey, remove these individuals. Okay. But well, okay. Okay. We, upon we, further- We trusted the attorney's advice to us and his comments to us that if we provided these five things, we had every confidence that these voters Sorry, would be I mean, immediately yeah. removed. Uh, uh, that's First of all, I advised the board. Uh, miss, the board last week, uh, indicate, or last hearing, indicated they would like certain information that they would consider, you know, to be credible challenges. Uh, these are the, I was going by what's in the challenge statute and advising the board, who is my client, uh, what, what, what things would need to be presented under the statute. We have then, since then, gone back and, uh, y'all aren't necessarily privy to these, but we've received other letters from other people who are challenging this process under the NVRA, and we have reviewed those things. So uh, I, I want everybody to understand, when I give advice at these meetings, it's to the task. board, and the public can rely on it. You, know, you were talking to, to me, but, sir, but, when yes. you made those comments. And so I, I advise the board here. Um, they asked me for legal advice in the interim, and I have looked at it based on the letters that were sent to us. So that's, that's how that process works. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. You know, I got to say, it's it's discouraging. I, I submitted 60-something uh, voters to you, I think, on the 13th of July. And if you had all this information, I sure would have appreciated you sharing that and saying, hey, we're shooting it down because of this or this. This is unfair to walk in here and, and just hear this right now, the issues you're having. And you know, I, I did review the National Voter Rights Act Mm -hmm. And they don't, I don't, there's not, they don't say you cannot remove voters. There are r reasons you can remove them. I don't have it right in front of me, but I've studied it. And there's viable reasons you can, if they move out of the area, I, I'd have to pull up the, the law, but they're, they can be removed. And I, it just blows me away, really. I, I would have really appreciated you sending us the information on what you had that you were going to share with us instead of, just torpedo in these efforts after we've spent hours and hours researching these voters. And I don't understand one thing you said in the 235B, they can't remove them until after November. Is that the case? That is the case, sir. Okay, well, can we still rule on them if they're, you know, they're, they're not right? All the folks I've submitted to you, 
are registered voters in the state of Florida. They all live there, they're registered to vote, and they're also registered voters here in Cobb County, Georgia, and that's unacceptable. I, they shouldn't be registered in two states. And I understand that. I would suggest that you take your issues or your concerns with Section 235 of the code is that's beyond well, my purview. Ma'am, does I, that... Sir, I did not interrupt you, therefore I would okay. ask that you I don't apologize. interrupt Go me. Ahead. Okay. But what I will say to you is Section 235B of the Georgia Election Code provides in pertinent part an elector <clears throat> placed on the inactive list of electors shall remain on such list until the day after the 2nd November general election held after that elector is placed on that inactive list. I'm reading the oh, language okay. from the code. My question is, does that supersede section 21-2217, the rules for determining residency, where it clearly outlines that somebody's gone to another state and registered to vote, they've lost their residency here in Georgia. You, if you're not, in the Secretary of State's website, the first two requirements to vote in this state, number one, you have to be a U.S. citizen, Number two, you have to be a resident of the county that you're voting in. And really, let's be clear, inactive and active, you're still a registered voter on the, on the system. It's, not a, it's just a status change is all it is. I understand, and my, your, to your question, I suggest that that is something to be taken up by the courts, not by this board. I'm going by the provision that's here. Will you, will you email us all the information you shared today so we can study it? Absolutely. I mean, that, it's really, it's, well, you know, honestly, it's disappointing to walk in here and hear this for the first time after this has been sent to you almost a month ago. It, really, it, it's just unfair to do that. We, we came to you last month with 66. I added another 33. And I, I just, you know, it's really, it's very disappointing. And so. I apologize for disappointing you. We basically, Janine and her staff, are, um, actually are going well above and beyond what they're even required to do in as much that they're going and they're, ma email, they're mailing notices to the individuals in the states where they uh, are currently uh, living. Uh -huh. um, and they're also reg in, proposed under the law, they're only required to email or mail something to their Georgia address. So for those individuals that were in North Carolina or what have you, they're, they're reaching out there. She, she and her staff take the time to go and look on um, MVP to identify. So the you're not the only ones that are doing work. The Janine and her staff I, are I doing work. I understand that. They provide yeah. that information to us. We are volunteers, just as our poll workers are volunteers. We review all of this information, myself, Jen, um, uh, Jessica, and Pat, and Steve, and this is where we've aligned. And so to the extent that, well, one, no motion has been made. I've just provided information that mm -hmm. I've identified. But to the extent that you don't out like the outcome, there is well, a procedure it's, it's provided under the code to simply appeal it. I believe you've been represented by counsel here before. Unfortunately, he's not here right now. Who, me? Uh, the, I haven't been The attorney that is represented, maybe it's the no, Astis. No, I, I haven't I been apologize. represented. But, I confuse uh, the two. I just feel like, you know, they, they bend over backwards to protect. To, Who to is not, they? Well, the whole election system did not disenfranchise people that have no right to be on the voting list. And actually, you're disenfranchising the legitimate voters that actually live here in Cobb County. And it's really, it's, dis, it's, it's disturbing to watch. These people don't even live in the state. Mr. They're Williams? registered in another state. Yes, ma'am. Could you, do you have uh, your information in front of you? I've got it in this file. It's uh, 96 votes. I think so we ought to just make a motion to put this on hold until next meeting, until everybody's satisfied. He just got, he said, these people have said they just got the material today. And so, is that, am I well, right? Well, fr from you all, I, we, we, yeah. I submitted it a month ago. We, we, haven't it, seen. we haven't seen what you're saying. You're just throwing okay. that on us now. I understand. I make and a motion. And some of the information is compiled by uh, Ms. Evelyn and her team. We received it today as well. So, um, but based upon the research that's been done with regard to the code, th this is where we've landed. Pat, with regard to your suggestion, I, I don't believe that we can um, do that because under the same Voting Rights Act, 90 days prior to an election, we cannot remove individuals from the um, well, from the voting. Ma'am, you're confusing the 229 or the with the 230 challenge. No, actually, I'm Is, not. Okay. I'm, I'm addressing Mr. Cartland's comment okay. that we should stop 
and I wasn't referencing Section 230 of the Georgia Code. I'm looking to the Voters Rights Act, and it's under the Voter Rights Act. If there is a federal election, you cannot remove anyone from the voter roll 90 days prior to that election. Okay, are we 90 days now before the election? The 90th day, I believe, is on the 10th. Chairwoman, okay, so we're I good. make a motion? Sure. So we got I, time. I'd like to make a motion that I'm just going to, in the interest of moving on, I, I don't think, that, do we have any more questions, I guess, among the team? I, I still think we ought to, we need to put this on a hold until we, they feel satisfied they received what they're supposed to have. Yes. But what are they supposed it, to are have? You making, let what me just are you we're, making we're a motion right to? right now that they did not get that they could have uh, rebuttal it. Yeah. I, 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 there's no, there's not, no process for the that. Process. There's no process for that in 229. But I, I'll make a motion uh, upon my well, review. Okay, sorry. We Because Ms. Asta is a challenger, okay, yep. she does have the opportunity Great. to speak. I, and my name is Carol Asta. And, and the question that I have is I, I submitted 45 um, new challenges from um, North Carolina. And I think 32 of those voted in North Carolina. Are, have all those been? I, I, and I addressed those, and I'm happy to restate it. Those individuals that we've identified, notwithstanding the information that we just talked through with Mr. Williams and Mr. Asta, those individuals will be uh, re removed from the voter roll. Even, the if they, even if they're marked inactive by the Secretary of State's office? That's correct, because they okay. have voted. OK. All right. So if we t if we table this now, these people will remain on. The no, yes. Right. So, so we don't want to table it. <laughs> I don't think you want to table it anyway because I don't know that we can convene a meeting and 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 pass on this by the tenth. And the tenth, that's the federal law. That's not within my. I, I, I can't I, change yes, that. I understand. I understand. I just wanted to clarify that the the people who have vote who have been shown to vote in. North Carolina, whether they're inactive or not, are going to be removed. I've identified 29, and I've got a full accounting of all of those people. I'm sure I've, uh, Director I've, Evelyn I've counted, has those. I counted 32. I've got 29. I think we so get together yeah. and align on where the discrepancy is. It's a three, sounds like a three person discrepancy. And obviously, the information on the North Carolina Secretary of State's website will bear that out. Yes. But it's 29 of the active voters. It's not the active. It's, this is, we're just talking about, of the 161 challenge, 83 are resubmitted, 78 are new. There are 43 remaining active of that total group. And of those 29 voted, those are the 29 that you refer to. So inactive, to answer your question fairly, the inactive voters we're not looking at canceling. They're not on that list. They're even if even if they voted another state, if they're inactive, you're not taking them off. We haven't made any motions, but that's, we haven't what, made that's, any motions, that's what the code that's, would state. That's what the code, if you read the code, that's what it provides. Even though that you received the challenge before they were, were marked as inactive? Not at the, the code doesn't provide anything with respect to timing. And again, that's what what list maintenance is for. Okay, thank you. Can I comment one thing? Uh, certainly, sir. We are down to nine minutes, and I, I know we're, we will okay. be asked to leave this, this okay. room. Okay, I understand. One thing that I'm really concerned with is there's no process in this county, in a lot of areas, you know, people come and go, they move out of the uh, area all the time. That's just part of America. But you all have no process in place to capture people when they leave your area. Ms. Evler has mentioned before that no one ever takes the time to contact the uh, Cobb Board of Elections and say, hey, cancel my registration, I'm, I'm moving. But every one of these people do contact the United States Postal Service. They fill out a change of address form, and that form asks them directly, is this a permanent or a temporary move? They check one box or the other, they sign it, so you've got a signed written document from the voter in question, which will show if they're permanently moving out. If they are, they don't belong on the Cobb County voting rolls. And the beautiful thing about that form, it's mandated by the Postal Service. They have to share that with you all if you just request it. 
In fact, you all are able to develop a commission, create a commission, and they have to share it with you. And I can tell from listening tonight that you're, you can't get enough help to run this, so you don't need extra work to do. But there's plenty of volunteers who would be glad to contact the post office once a month, get the change of address forms for the people that are leaving. It's completely objective. If they've checked it's a permanent move, present it to you all, and they should be immediately removed from the Cobb County voter rolls. That's, you got your mission statement. It says you're gonna be, provide accurate records or you're, uh, let me read it. It says the mission of the Cobb County Elections Department is to register citizens of Cobb County to vote and ensure that elections are free, impartial, fair, and accurate. And maintaining accurate voter rolls is how you fill that, that mission. And I'd really love to see you all put a process in place. There, uh, I'll give you a good example. Uh, are you familiar with the uh, ERIC system? We just, George right. signed up with them in 2000. Well, anyway, we had a lady last month that called in, uh, Rochelle Davis. She lived in Mableton and moved to New Jersey, as she said, years and years ago. And she was astounded. She actually put in a change of address form and thought that, my gosh, that when I did that, it, it canceled my registration here. Surprise to her and to you all. No, she stays on the election system here and goes there. And, but, I, and I think you have a lot of Rochelle Davises throughout your system that have been here for years that have never lived in Cobb County and that are on your roll showing as active voters. And that's a problem. Sir, that, that, the NCOA form is, does, is not comparable. It's not something that NCOA went, to, I don't know why Ms. Rochelle, and I do recall the conversation or her statement, uh -huh. I don't know why she assumed that when she submitted that form that it would automatically take her off the voter rolls. However, I do note the time is 539 and we are required to be out of this room and so we appreciate your being here this afternoon, and um, we have to conclude the business of the, the board. Okay, I understand. I sure appreciate that you can send over all the uh, uh, laws you're referencing so Absolutely. we can go through that, and the voters that you specifically have removed. Understood. And, and, that, uh, and I know you're busy, but really it's, it is disappointing to <coughs> put all the effort in it, and then you hear all this right as you're walking up to challenge them. Understood. I don't think that's fair. I think that should have been provided much earlier. The, the, so. If that's the case, then we probably need to talk to the legislature for them to spell out a process here. Because again, we are creating the five elements as identified not, to you. I'm not were, questioning I'm the just, five elements. What I'm suggesting to you is they were put in place in the absence of our state legislature, the state election board, and the secretary of state making any type of determination. So we are here attempting to hear your challenges and do it in a fair and equitable way by saying at a minimum, if you provide us with a certain amount of information, we will listen to it, we will I take it up. Understood, but a fair part would be providing that information back to us if you had stuff you're gonna present to us as well before the meeting. <coughs> I, just, I understand that that's your request, but we've not, there, that process is not provided for here. Chairwoman Silas, yes. I'd like to move to reject the challenge of electors presently reflecting as having a status of inactive. Um, I show that to be 99 of the 161 because section 235 of the Georgia election code expressly requires the secretary of state to maintain a list of inactive voters and such elector is required to remain on that list until after the 2nd of November, the 2nd November general election held after the registrant is placed on the list. So that motion is to leave, to reject the challenge of those specific 99 voters due to section 235. I'll second it. And do we call a vote? Yeah, it's been moved and properly seconded to approve the rejection of the challenge of individuals that are noted as inactive currently on the uh, voter roll. All those in favor, or for that matter, opposed. If you'll wait just one moment while we conclude the business, sir. Uh, the motion passes, so the uh, challenge of those 99 uh, inactive uh, voters or electors is um, declined. Anything further? 
If I could ask you, we're really, when I, we adjourn, then you can share it. I apologize. I'm not trying to be abrupt with you, but we're really trying to conclude the business because I've got to be out of here. We've got to be out of here in three minutes. I'm also going to move here to reject the challenge of electors that are, um, that are active and have not voted. So there were 43 active, there were 29 voted. I'm going to reject that, move to reject that challenge because of section 20507 D1B of the Title 52, also known as the National Voting Rights Act, which prohibits specifically a state from removing the name of a registrant from the official list of eligible voters in elections for federal office on the ground that the registrant has changed residence unless the registrant has failed to respond to a notice and has not voted or appeared to vote, and if necessary, correct their registrant's record in an election during the period beginning on the date of the notice and ending on the day after the date of the second general election for federal office that occurs after the date of the notice. I'm reading all that into a record, but it is explicitly section 20507 D1B of Title 52, which is the National Voting Rights Act, and I am rejecting the active voter challenges for the remaining voters on these challenges of the 161. Is there a second? I'll second it. But so that I can ask the question. Second, and then we'll open it up for two minutes for discussion. Uh, Jennifer, are you yes. are you saying that the folks? Sorry, are you saying that the folks that have voted in the information provided are they going to be uh, removed from the rolls? Yes, there are twenty nine people that we can absolutely remove from the rolls that they have voted in 2022 or 2020. We have that documentation presented by Ms. Asta. I have that, I mean, I think Janine's probably seen, or Director Evelyn's probably seen it. We have those 29 that voted. But are you saying that if they're inactive and they voted, that they are not removed? I, I looked, of the 43 active, 29 of them voted. Right, but there are a number of inactives that have voted, right? No. There are none? I'd have to go back and double check. But the, I'm just talking, the inactive ones, we can't remove if they're inactive. I don't necessarily agree with that, but if that's the position of the board. The, the inactive ones, I'm under the, you know, under 235, if they're marked inactive, we can't remove those ones. We can remove the 29 who voted who are currently active. We do. Okay. Yeah, we there's a motion on the table. It's been seconded. There's obviously a question. I mean, I'll call for the vote. It's been it's been moved and properly seconded. So yeah, I mean, it's been moved and properly seconded. I'm sorry. Yeah, there's a motion open. You can, she can withdraw it. Otherwise, you have to go ahead and vote. Right. So, our, do you want to withdraw your vote or your motion? I do not. Okay. So it's been. But, but you are saying that we remove those who have voted elsewhere. I would like to remove the 29 I've identified of the 43 who have voted, and the remaining active would be remain. Per NVRA. Okay. okay. I'm sticking to it. So the motion has been, it's been moved and properly seconded to remove the individuals that are noted as inactive, but that have voted else, I'm sorry, that are noted as active and have voted elsewhere. And that number is 29, correct? Have I restated that correctly? Yes, ma'am. Okay. 29. And in connection with that, we would leave those individuals on the roll to the extent that there are three that are noted as inactive but have voted elsewhere. I don't have verification of that. What's okay. The I only have the data based upon the active voters because we t we're leaving the inactive on. Okay. We only have the data on the active. Do you want to have this discussion in open session? No, I don't want to have this discussion in open session, and we can't. Yep. Uh, I would. Yeah, go. You can, with, yeah, I, that, that would be good. Sounds like we need to withdraw the motion, which I do. Let's go. 
So, um, board member comments. I I don't. Are there any board member comments? We've got better a, you than me. Yeah, okay. Um, next scheduled board meeting is September the twelfth at two. Um, yeah, at three p.m. Uh, I'm presuming there is nothing for executive session, Daniel. We'll just save it for next time. Okay, got it. Meeting is adjourned at five.